But what about my job, old boy? Can't just drop everything and walk away. Do you enjoy your job that much? Mark asked softly. Does peddling motor cars feed your soul? Hey, Dickie began to look uncomfortable. It's not a case of enjoying it. I mean, nobody really enjoys having to work, do they? I mean, it's just something one does, you know. One's lucky to find something one can do reasonably well where one can earn an honest coin, and one does it. I wonder, Mark mused. Tell me, Dickie, what is most important, the coin or the good feeling down there in your guts? Dickie stared at him, his lower jaw sagging slightly, exposing a mouthful of half-masticated rice. Out there I felt clean and tall, Mark went on, fiddling with his beer stein. There were no bosses, no clients, no hustling for a commission. I don't know, Dickie. Out there I felt... <sighs> important. Important? Dickie swallowed the unchewed curry noisily. Important? <laughs> hey now, old boy. They're selling rakes like you and me on the street corners at nightpence a bunch. He washed down the rice with a swallow of beer and then patted the froth from his upper lip with the crisp white handkerchief from his breast pocket. Take an old dog's advice. When you say your prayers at night, give thanks that you're a good motor car salesman and that you've found that out. Just do it, old son, and don't think about it or it'll break your heart. He spoke with an air of finality that declared the subject closed and stooped to open his briefcase on the floor beside his chair. Here, I've something for you. There were a dozen thick letters in Marion Littlejohn's neat feminine hand, all in blue envelopes, a colour which she had explained in previous letters indicated undying love. There was also an account for a disputed twelve and sixpence, which his tailor insisted Mark had underpaid, and there was another envelope of marbled paper, pale beige and watered expensively, with Mark's name blazoned across it in a peremptory, arrogant hand, and no address. Mark singled it out and turned it over to examine the crest, thickly crusted in heavy embossing that stood out on the flap. Dickie watched him open it, and then leaned forward to read it unashamedly. But Mark saved him the effort and flipped it across to him. Regimental dinner, he explained. Now you'll just make it, Dickie pointed out. Friday the 16th. Then his voice changed, imitating a regimental sergeant major. Two o' hundred hours sharpish, dress formal, an R.S. bloody V.P. Take your dressing from the right, you lucky blighter. Your guinea has been paid by your colonel-in-chief, Lord Muckamuck General Courtney, his exalted self. Off you go, my boy, drink his champagne and steal a handful of cigars. Up the workers, say I. I think I'll give it a miss, murmured Mark, and placed Marion's letters in his inside pocket to prevent Dicky reading those also. You've gone bush crazy. The sun touched you, old boy, Dickie declared solemnly. Think of those three hundred potential owners of Cadillacs sitting around one table, pissed to the wide, and smoking free cigars. Captive audience! Whip around the table and peddle them a Cadillac each while they're still stunned by the speeches. Were you in France? Mark asked. Not France, Dickie's expression changed. Palestine, Gallipoli, and such like sunny climes. The memory darkened his eyes. Then you'll know why I don't feel like going up to the old fort to celebrate the experience, Mark told him, and Dicky Lankham studied him across the loaded table. He had made himself a judge of character, of men and their workings. He had to be a good judge to be a good salesman, so he was surprised that he had not recognised the change in Mark sooner. Looking at him now, Dicky knew that he had acquired something, some new reserve of strength and resolution, the likes of which few men gathered about them in a lifetime. Suddenly he felt a humility in Mark's presence, and although it was tinged with envy, the envy was without rancour. Here was a man who was going somewhere, to a place where he would never be able to follow, a path that needed a man with a lion's liver to tread. He wanted to reach across the table and shake Mark's hand and wish him well on the journey. But instead he spoke quietly, dropping the usual light and cavalier facade. I wish you'd think about it, Mark. General Courtney came to see me himself, and he went on to tell him of the visit, of Sean Courtney's anger when he had heard that Mark had been discharged at his daughter's behest. He asked for you to be there especially, Mark, and he really meant it. Mark showed his invitation at the gates and was passed through the massive stone outer fortifications. 
There were fairy lights strung in the trees along the pathway that led through the gardens of the old fort, giving the evening a frivolous carnival feeling at odds with the usual atmosphere this bastion had known from the earliest British occupation, through siege and war with Dutch and Zulu, many of the Empire's warriors who had paused there on their occasions. There were other guests ahead of him and behind him on the pathway, but Mark avoided them, feeling self-conscious in the dinner jacket he had hired from the pawnbroker when he retrieved his decorations. The garment had the venerable greenish tinge of age and was ventilated in places by the ravages of moths. It was too tight across the shoulders and too full in the belly, and it exposed too much cuff and sock. But when he had pointed this out to the pawnbroker, the man had asked him to finger the pure silk lining and had reduced the higher fee to five shillings. Miserably, he joined the file of other dinner-jacketed figures on the steps of the drill hall, and when his turn came, he stepped up to the reception line. So, said General Sean Courtney, you came. The craggy features were suddenly boyish, as he took Mark's hand, in a grip that felt like tortoise shell, cool and hard and calloused. He stood at the head of the reception line like a tower, broad and powerful, resplendent in immaculately cut black and crisp starch white, with a gaudy block of silk ribbons and enamel crosses and orders across his chest. With a twitch of an imperial eyebrow, he summoned one of his staff. "'This is Mark Anders,' he said. "'You remember the old firm of Anders and MacDonald, 1st Brigade?' "'Indeed, sir.' The officer looked at Mark with quick interest, his eye dropping from his face to the silk ribbons on his lapel and back to his face. "'Now you look after him,' said General Courtney. And then to Mark, "'Get yourself a drink, son, and I'll talk to you later.' He released Mark's hand and turned to the next in line. But such was the magnetism and charm of the big man that after the brief contact and the few gruff words, Mark was no longer the gawky stranger, callow and awkward in cast-off clothes, but an honoured guest worthy of special attention. The subaltern took his charge seriously and led Mark into the dense crowd of black-clad males, all of them still subdued and self-conscious in their unaccustomed finery, standing in stiff knots, although the waiters moved among them bearing silver trays laden with the regiment's hospitality. "'A whisky, is it?' asked the subaltern, and picked a glass from one of the trays. "'All liquid refreshment tonight is with the General's compliments,' and took another glass for himself. "'Cheers! Now let's see. First Brigade,' and he looked around. "'You must remember Hooper or Denison?' He remembered them and others, dozens of them. Some were vaguely familiar features, just shades at the edge of his memory. But others he knew well and liked, or disliked, and even hated. With some he had shared food or passed a cigarette butt back and forth. With others he had shared moments of terror or exquisite boredom. The good ones, the workers, the cowards, and the shirkers and the bullies were all there. And the whisky came endlessly on silver trays. They remembered him also. Men he had never seen in his life came up to him. You remember me? I was a section leader at Darcy Wood when you and MacDonald... And others. Are you the Anders? I thought you'd be older somehow. Your glass is empty. And the whisky kept coming on the silver trays. And Mark felt tall and clever, for men listened when he talked, and witty, for men laughed when he jested. They sat at a table that stretched the full length of the hall and was covered with a damask cloth of dazzling white. The regimental silver blinked like heliographs in the candlelight, and now it was champagne cascading into crystal glass in showers of golden bubbles. All around the comradely uproar of laughter and of raised voices, and each time Mark lowered his glass, there was a turbaned figure at his side and a dark hand poising the green bottle over his glass. He sagged back in his chair with his thumbs hooked in his armpits and a black cigar sticking a foot out of his mouth. Hear, hearing and quite writing, the after-dinner speakers as owlish and wise as the best of them, exchanging knowledgeable nods of agreement with his neighbours while the ruby port smouldered in his glass. When the general rose from his centre seat at the cross-piece of the table, there was an audible stir in the company, which had become heavy and almost somnolent with port and long meandering speeches. They grinned at each other now in anticipation, and though Mark had never heard Sean Courtney speak, he sensed the interest and recharged enthusiasm, and he sat up in his chair. The general did not disappoint them. He started with a story that left them stunned for a moment, gasping for breath, 
before they could bellow with laughter. Then he went at them in a relaxed, easy manner that seemed casual and natural, but using words like a master swordsman using a rapier, a jest, an oath, a solid piece of good sense, something they wanted to hear followed immediately by something that disturbed them, singling out individuals for praise or gentle censure. Third this year in the National Polo Championships, gentlemen, an honour which the regiment carried easily last year, but a certain gentleman seated at this board has chosen to ride for the sugar planters now, a decision which it is his God-given right to make, and which I am certain not one of us here would condemn, said Sean Courtney, and he paused, grinning evilly and smoothing his whiskers, while the entire company booed raucously and hammered the table with their dessert spoons. The victim flushed a vivid scarlet and squirmed in the cacophony. However, good news and great expectations for the Africa Cup this year. By dint of adroit sleuthing, it has been discovered that dwelling in our very midst, and the next moment the entire hall was slapping palm to palm, a great thunder of sound, and heads were craning down to Mark's end of the table, while the general nodded and beamed at him, and when Mark slumped down quickly in his seat and tried to make his lanky frame fold like a carpenter's ruler, Sean Courtney called, Stand up, son, let them get a good look at you. Mark rose uncertainly and bobbed his head left and right, and not until later did it occur to him that he had been skilfully manoeuvred into accepting their applause, or that in doing so he was committed. It was the first time he witnessed, from a front-row seat, the general handling the destiny of a man and achieving his object without apparent effort. He was pondering this a little muzzily as he steered for the safe base of the next lamp post. It would, of course, have been wiser and safer to accept the offer made to him by one of the rickshaw drivers at the gates of the fort, when he had reeled out into the street two hours after midnight. However, his recent unemployment and extravagant expenditure on fancy clothing had left him no choice as to his means of transport. He faced now a walk of some three miles in the dark, and his progress was erratic enough to make it a long journey. He reached the lamp post and braced himself just as a black Rolls Royce stopped beside him and the back door swung open. Get in, said the general, and as Mark tumbled ungracefully into the soft leather seat, an iron grip steadied him. You are not a drinking man, it was a statement, not a question, and Mark had to agree. No, sir. You've got a choice, said the general. Learn or leave it alone completely. Sean had waited for almost half an hour the rolls parked under the banyan trees, for Mark to appear through the gates, and he had been on the point of abandoning the evening and giving his driver the order to return to Emoyeni when Mark had tottered out into the street, brushed away the importunate rickshaw drivers and set off like a crab along the pavement, travelling further sideways than forward. The rolls had crept silently along behind him, with the headlights dark, and Sean Courtney had watched with a benevolent smile the young man's erratic progress. He felt a gentle indulgence for the lad and for himself, for the odd little quirks and whims with which he still surprised himself occasionally. At sixty-two years of age, a man should know himself, know every strength and be able to exploit it, know every weakness and have built a secure buttress against it. Yet here he was, for no good reason that he could fathom, becoming more and more emotionally involved with a young stranger, spending time and thought, for he was not sure what end. Perhaps the boy reminded him of himself at the same age. And now he thought about it, he did detect beneath the warm glow of champagne in his belly the nostalgia for that troubled time of doubt and shining ambition when a boy stood on the threshold of manhood. Perhaps it was that he admired. No, cherished was a better word. Cherished special quality in any animal. A fine horse, a good dog, a young man. That excellence that horsemen might call blood or a dog-handler, class. He had detected it in Mark Anders, and as even a blood horse might be damaged by bad handling or a class dog spoiled, so a young man who had the same quality needed advice and direction and opportunity to develop his full capability. There was too much mediocrity and too much dross in this world, Sean thought, so that when he found class, he was drawn strongly to it. Or perhaps again, and suddenly he felt that terrible black wave of mourning sweep over him. Or perhaps it is simply that I do not have a son. A son. A son.
a son. There had been three sons. One had died before he had lived, still born in the great wilderness beyond the Limpopo River. Another had been born by a woman who was not his wife, and the son had called another man father. Here Sean felt the melancholy deepen, laden with guilt. But this son was dead also, burned to a charred black mass in the flimsy machine of wood and canvas in which he had flown the sky. The words of Gary's dedication to his new book was clear in Sean's mind. This book is dedicated to Captain Michael Courtney, DFC, one of the young eagles who will fly no more. Michael had been Sean's natural son, made in the belly of his brother's wife. The third son lived still, but he was a son in name only, and Sean would have changed that name had it been within his power. Those ugly incidents that preceded Dirk Courtney's departure from Ladyburg so many years before, among them casual arson and careless murder, were nothing compared to the evil deeds he had perpetrated since his return. Those close to him knew better than to speak the name Dirk Courtney in his hearing. Now he felt the melancholy change to the old anger, and to forestall it. He leaned forward in his seat and tapped the chauffeur's shoulder. "'Pull up beside him,' he said, pointing to Mark Anders. "'What you need is fresh air,' Sean Courtney told Mark. "'It will sober you up and make you puke, either of which is desirable.' And by the time the rolls parked at the foot of West Street Pier, Mark had, by dint of enormous mental effort, regained control of his eyes. At first, every time he peered at the general beside him, he had the nauseous certainty that there was a third eye growing in the centre of his forehead, and that he had multiple ears on each side of his head, like ripples on the surface of a pond. Mark's voice had at first been as uncontrolled, and he had listened with mild disbelief to the odd, blurred sounds with which his lips had replied to the general's questions and comments. But when he frowned with the effort, and spoke with the exaggerated slowness and articulation, it sounded vaguely intelligible. However, it was only when they walked side by side down through the loose sand to the edge of the sea, where the outgoing tide had left the sand hard and wet and smooth, that he began to listen to what the general was saying, and it wasn't tea-party talk. He was talking of power and powerful men. He was talking of endeavour and reward, and though his voice was rumbling and relaxed, yet it was like the purr of an old lion who was just killed and would kill again. Somehow, Mark sensed that what he was hearing was of great value, and he hated himself for the alcohol in his veins that slowed his mind and halted his tongue. He fought it off actively. They walked down along the glistening strip of wet, smooth sand that was polished yellow by the sinking glow of the late moon. The sea smelt of salt and iodine, a crisp, antiseptic smell, and the little breeze chilled him so that he shivered, even in his dinner jacket. But soon his brain was keeping pace with that of the burly figure that limped beside him, and slowly a sense of excitement built up within him as he heard things said that he had only sensed deep in some secret place of his soul, ideas that he recognised, but that he believed were his alone. His tongue lost its drag and blur, and he felt suddenly bright as a blade, and light as the swallow that drinks in flight as it skims the water. He remembered how he had at one time suspected that this man might have been responsible in some way for the loss of Andersland and the old man's death. By now those suspicions smacked almost of blasphemy, and he thrust them aside to throw all his mind into the discussion in which he found himself so deeply involved. He never did suspect until long afterwards how important that single night's talk would be in his life, and if he had known, perhaps his tongue would have seized up solid in his mouth and his brain refused to keep pace, for he was undergoing a rigorous examination. Ideas thrown at Mark, seemingly at random, were for him to pick up and carry forward or to reject and leave lying. Every question raked his conscience and bared his principles, and gradually, skilfully, he was forced to commit himself on every subject from religion to politics, from patriotism to morals. Once or twice the general chuckled, "'You're a radical. Did you know that? "'But I suppose I was at your age. "'We all want to change the world. "'Now tell me, what do you think about?' "'And the next question was not related to the one that preceded it. "'There are ten million black men in this country and a million whites. "'How do you think they are going to be able to live together "'for the next thousand years?' "'Mark gulped at the enormity of the question, "'and then began to talk. 
The moon paled away in the coming of the dawn, and Mark walked on into an enchanted world of flaming ideas and amazing visions. Though he could not know it, his excitement was shared. Louis Borter, the old warrior and statesman, had said to Sean once, Even the best of us gets old and tired, Sean, and when that happens, a man should have somebody to whom he can pass the torch and let him carry it on. With a suddenness that took them both by surprise, the night was past, and the sky flamed with gold and pink. They stood side by side and watched the rim of the sun rise from the dark green sea and climb swiftly into the sky. I've needed an assistant for many years now. My wife hounds me, Sean chuckled at the hyperbole, and I have promised her I'll find one, but I need somebody quick and bright and trustworthy. They are hard to find. Sean's cigar was long dead and horribly chewed. He took it from his mouth and examined it with mild disapproval before tossing it into the creeping wavelets at his feet. It would be a hell of a job, no regular hours, no set duties, and God knows I'd hate to work for me because I'm a cantankerous, unsympathetic old bastard. But on the other hand, one thing I'd guarantee, whoever took the job wouldn't die of boredom, and he'd get to learn a thing or two. He turned now, thrusting his head forward and staring into Mark's face. The wind had ruffled his beard, and he had long ago stripped off his black tie and thrust it into a pocket. The golden rays of the rising sun caught his eyes, and they were a peculiarly beautiful shade of blue. Do you want the job? he demanded. Yes, sir, Mark answered instantly, dazzled by the prospect of an endless association with this incredible man. You haven't asked about the money, growled Sean. Oh, the money isn't important. Lesson number one. Sean cocked a beetling black eyebrow over the amused blue twinkle of his eye. The money is always important. The next time Mark entered the gates of Emoyeni was to enter a new life, an existence beyond any he had ever imagined. And yet, in all the overpowering new experience, even in the whirl of having to adjust to new ideas, to the daunting procession of visitors and endless new tasks, there was one moment that Mark dreaded constantly. This was his next meeting with Miss Storm Courtney. However, he would never know if it had not been carefully arranged by General Courtney. But Storm was not at Emoyeni on Mark's first day, nor during the days that followed, although the memory of her presence seemed everywhere in the portraits and photographs in every room, especially the full-length oil in the library where Mark spent much of his time. She was dressed in a full-length ivory-coloured dress, seated at the grand piano in the main drawing-room and the artist had managed to capture a little of her beauty and spirit. Mark found the tantalising scrutiny which the portrait directed at him disconcerting. Quickly a relationship was established between Mark and the General, and during the first few days the last of Sean's misgivings were set at rest. It was seldom that the close proximity of another human being over an extended period of time did not begin to irritate Sean, and yet with this youngster he found himself seeking his company. His first ideas had been that Mark should be taught to deal with day-to-day -day correspondence and all the other time-consuming trivia, leaving Sean a little more leisure and time to devote to the important areas of business and politics. Now he would drift through into the library at odd times to discuss an idea with Mark, enjoying seeing it through younger and fresher eyes, or he might dismiss his chauffeur and have Mark drive the rolls out to one of the sawmills or to a board meeting in the city sitting up front beside him on the journey and reminiscing about those days in France or going further back to the time before Mark was born, enjoying Mark's engrossing interest in talks of gold prospecting and ivory hunting in the great wilderness beyond the Limpopo River in the north. There'll be an interesting debate in assembly today, Mark. I'm going to give that bastard Hendricks hell on the railway budget. Drive me down and you can listen from the visitors' gallery. Those letters can wait until tomorrow. There's been a breakdown at the Amvoti sawmill. We'll take the shotguns on the way back and try and pick up a couple of guinea fowl. Drill hall at eight o'clock tonight, Mark, if you aren't doing anything important, which was a command, no matter how delicate the phrasing. And Mark found himself sucked gently back into the ranks of the peacetime regiment. He found it different from France, for he now had powerful patronage. You are no use to me as a third-rank marker. You're getting to know the way I work, son, and I want you at hand even when we are playing at soldiers. Besides, and here Sean grinned that evil, knowing grin, you need a little time for range practice. 
At the next turnout, still not accustomed to the speed with which things happened in the world ruled by Sean Courtney, Mark found himself in the full fig of second lieutenant, including Sam Brown cross-strap and shining single pips on his shoulders. He had expected antagonism, or at least condescension, from his brother officers, but found that when he was placed in command of range drill, he was received with universal enthusiasm. In the household, Mark's standing was not at first clear. He was awed by the mistress of Emoieni, by her mature beauty and cool efficiency. She was remote but courteous for the first two weeks or so, referring to him as Mr. Anders, and any request was preceded by a meticulous please, and followed by an equally punctilious thank you. When the general and Mark were at Emoieni for the midday meal, Mark was served by one of the servants from a silver tray in the library, and in the evenings, after he had taken his leave from the general, he climbed on the elderly aerial square four motorcycle he had acquired and clattered off down the hill into the sweltering basin of the city to his verminous lodgings in Point Road. Ruth Courtney was watching Mark with an even shrewder eye than her husband had used. Had he in any way fallen short of her standards, she would have had no compunction in immediately bringing all her influence to bear on Sean for his dismissal. One morning, while Mark was at work in the library, Ruth came in from the garden with an armful of cut flowers. Oh, "'Don't let me disturb you,' she began to arrange the flowers in the silver bowl on the central table. For the first few minutes she worked in silence, and then, in a natural and friendly manner, she began to chat to Mark, quietly drawing from him the details of his domestic arrangements, where he slept and ate and who did his laundry, and secretly she was appalled. You must bring your laundry up here to be done with the household washing. Well, it's very kind of you, Mrs. Courtney. I don't want to be a nuisance. Oh, nonsense. There are two derby wallers with nothing else to do but wash and iron. Even Ruth Courtney, one of the first ladies of Natal, still a renowned beauty as a matron well past forty years of age, was not immune to Mark's unstudied appeal. To his natural charm was added the beneficial effect his coming had upon her own man. Sean seemed younger, more light-hearted in these last weeks, and watching it she realised that it was not only the burden of routine work that had been lifted from him. The boy was giving him back a little of that spirit of youth, that freshness of thought, that energy and enthusiasm for the things of life that had gone slightly stale and seemed no longer quite worth the effort. It was their custom to spend the hour before bed in Ruth's boudoir, Sean lounging in a quilted dressing gown, watching her brush out her hair and cream her face, smoking his last cigar, discussing the day's events, while he enjoyed her still slim, lithe body under the thin silk of her nightdress, feeling the slow awakening of his own body in anticipation of the moment when she would turn from watching him in the mirror and rise, holding out one hand to him, and lead him through into the bedroom, to the huge four-poster bed under the draped and tasselled velvet canopy. Three or four times in the weeks since Mark's arrival in the household, Sean had made a remark so radical, so unlike his usual old-fashioned conservative self, that Ruth had dropped the silver hairbrush into her lap and turned to stare at him. Each time he had laughed self-consciously and held up a hand to prevent her teasing. All right, I know what you're going to say, but I, I, I was discussing it with young Mark. He would chuckle again. <laughs> that boy talks a lot of good sense. Then one evening, after Mark had been with them just over a month, they had sat in companionable silence for a while, when Sean said suddenly, Young Mark, doesn't he remind you of Michael? I, I hadn't noticed, no, and no, I don't think so. No, no, I don't. I, I don't mean his looks. It's just something about the way he thinks. He thinks. He thinks. He thinks. Ruth felt the old crushing regret welling up within her, like a cold, dark tide. She had never given Sean a son. It was the only true regret, the only shadow on all their sunlit years together. Her shoulders sagged now, as though under the burden of her regret, and she looked at herself in the mirror, seeing the guilt of her inadequacy in her own eyes. Sean had not noticed, had gone on blithely. Well, I can hardly wait until February. Oh, it's going to break Hamilton's heart to hand over that big silver mug. Mark's changed the whole spirit of the team. They know they can win now with him shooting number one. She had listened quietly, hating herself for not being able to give him what he had wanted so badly, and she glanced down at the little carved statue of the god Tor on her dressing table. 
It had stood there all these years since Sean had given it to her, a talisman of fertility. Storm had been conceived in the height of a raging electrical thunderstorm and had been named for it. He had joked that it needed thunder and had given her the little goblet. A fat lot of help you were, she thought bitterly, and looked up at her own body under the silk in the mirror. So good to look at and so damned useless. She did not usually curse. It was a measure of her distress. Lovely as it was, her body would not bear another child. All it was good for now was to give him pleasure. She stood up abruptly, her nightly ritual incomplete, and she crossed to where he sat and removed the cigar from his lips, crushing it out deliberately in the big glass ashtray. Surprised, he looked up at her, about to ask a question, but the words never reached his lips. Her eyes were half-hooded, they drooped languorously, and her lips pouted slightly to reveal the white small teeth, and there were spots of hectic colour on her high, beautifully moulded cheekbones. Sean knew this expression, and the mood it heralded. He felt his heart lurch, and then begin to pound like an animal in the cage of his ribs. Usually their loving was a thing of depth and mutual compassion, a thing grown strong and good over the years, a complete blending of two persons, symbolic of their lives together. But once in a rare while Ruth would droop her eyelids and pout that way with the colour in her cheeks, and what followed was so wild and wanton and uncontrolled that it reminded him of some devastating natural phenomenon. She pushed one slim, pale hand into his gown, and long nails raked lightly across his stomach, so that his skin was instantly tingling and alive, and she leaned forward and with the other hand twined her fingers into his beard and twisted his face up to her and kissed him full on the lips, thrusting a sharp pink tongue deep into his mouth. Sean let out a growl and seized her, trying to draw her down into his lap, and at the same time pulling open the bodice of her nightdress so that her small pointed breasts fell free. But she was quick and strong, twisting out of his grip, the ivory and pink sheen of her skin glowing through the transparent silk of her gown and her bared breasts joggling delightedly as she flew on long, shapely legs into the bedroom, her laughter mocking and goading and inviting. The following morning, Ruth cut an armful of crimson and white carnations and carried them into the library where young Mark Anders was at work. He stood up immediately, and as she replied to his greeting, she studied his face. She had not truly realised how handsome he was, and she saw now that it was a face that would age well. There was a good bone structure and a proud, strong nose. He was one of those lucky ones who would improve with the addition of a few wrinkles and lines around the eyes and a little silver in the hair. That was a long way off, of course. However, now it was the eyes that demanded attention. Yes, she thought, looking into his eyes. Sean is right. He has the same strength and goodness that Michael had. She watched him surreptitiously as she worked at her flower arrangement, deliberately picking the words as she began to chat to him. And when she had completed the flower bowl, she stood back to admire her work and spoke without looking at him. Why don't you join us for lunch on the terrace, Mark? and the use of his name was deliberate, both of them very conscious of it, as it was spoken. Unless you'd prefer to continue eating here. Sean glanced up from his newspaper as Mark came out onto the terrace, but his expression did not change as Ruth waved Mark to the seat opposite him, and he immediately plunged back into the paper and angrily read out the editorial to them, mocking the writer by his tone and emphasis before crumpling the news sheet and dropping it beside his chair. The man's a raving bloody idiot. They should lock him up. Well, sir, Mark began delicately. Ruth sighed, a silent breath of relief, for she had not consulted Sean on the new luncheon arrangements, but the two of them were instantly in deep discussion. And when the main course was served, Sean growled, Take care of the chicken, Mark, and I'll handle the duck. So that the two of them were carving and arguing at the same time, like members of the same family and she covered her smile with her table napkin, as Sean ungraciously conceded a debating point to his junior. Well, I'm, I'm not saying you're right, of course, but if you are, then how do you account for the fact that... And he was attacking again from a different direction, and Ruth turned to listen as Mark adroitly defended himself again. As she listened, she began to appreciate a little more why Sean had chosen him. It was over the coffee that Mark learned at last what had become of Storm Courtney. Sean suddenly turned to Ruth. 
Was there a letter from Storm this morning? When she shook her head, he went on. That damned uppity little missy must learn a few manners. There hasn't been a letter in nearly two weeks. Just where are they supposed to be now? Rome, said Ruth. Rome, grunted Sean. The bunch of Latin lovers pinching her backside. Sean, Ruth reprimanded him primly. I beg your pardon. He looked a little abashed and then grinned wickedly. But she's probably putting it in the correct position for pinching right at this moment, if I know her. That night, when Mark sat down to write to Mary and Little John, he realised how the mere mention of Storm Courtney's name had altered his whole attention to the girl he was supposed to marry. Under the enormous workload which Sean Courtney had dropped casually on his shoulders, Mark's letter to Marion was no longer a daily ritual, and at times there were weeks between them. On the other hand, her letters to him never faltered in regularity and warmth, but he found that it was not really the pressure of work that made him keep deferring their next meeting. He sat now, chewing the end of his pen, until the wood splintered, seeking words and inspiration, finding it difficult to write down flowery expressions of undying love, on every page. Each empty page was as daunting as a Saharan crossing, yet it had to be filled. We will be travelling to Johannesburg next weekend to compete in the annual shooting match for the Africa Cup, he wrote, and then pondered how to get a little more mileage out of that intelligence. It should be good for at least a page. Mary and Little John belonged to a life that he had left behind him when he passed through the gates of Emoyeni. He faced this fact at last, but was nonetheless dismayed by the sense of guilt the knowledge brought him, and he tried to deny it and continue with the letter, but images kept intruding themselves, and the main of these was a picture of Storm Courtney, gay and sleek, glitteringly beautiful, and as unobtainable as the stars. The Africa Cup stood almost as high as a man's chest on a base of polished ebony. The Emoyeni houseboys had polished it for three days before they had achieved the lustre that General Courtney found acceptable, and now the cup formed the centrepiece of the buffet table, elevated on a pyramid of yellow roses. The buffet was set in the antechamber to the main ballroom, and both rooms overflowed with the hundreds of guests that Sean Courtney had invited to celebrate his triumph. He had even invited Colonel Hamilton of the Cape Town Highlanders to bring his senior officers by Union Castle liner, travelling first class as the General's guests to attend the ball. Hamilton had refused by means of a polite thank you note, four lines long without counting the address and the closing salutation. The cup had been in the Cape Town Castle since it had been presented by Queen Victoria in the first year of the Boer War, and Hamilton's mortification added not a little to Sean Courtney's expansive mood. For Mark, it had been the busiest period he had known since coming to Emoyeni. Ruth Courtney had come to place more and more trust in Mark, and under her supervision he had done much of the work of preparing the invitations and handling the logistics of food and liquor. Now she had him dancing with all of the ugly girls who would otherwise have sat disconsolately along the wall, and at the end of each dance the general summoned him with an imperious wave of his cigar above the heads of his guests to the buffet table where he had taken up a permanent stance close to the cup. Councillor, I want you to meet my new assistant. Mark, this is Councillor Evans. That's right, pussy. This is the young fellow who clinched it for us. And while Mark stood colouring with embarrassment, the general repeated for the fifth or sixth time that evening a shot-by-shot -shot account of the final day's competition when the two leading regiments had tied in the team events and the judges had asked for an individual reshoot to break the deadlock. A crosswind gusting up to 20 or 30 miles an hour and the first shoot at 200 yards. Mark marvelled at the intense pleasure this trinket gave the general. A man whose fortune was almost beyond calculation, whose land could be measured by the hundreds of square miles, who owned priceless paintings and antique books, jewellery and precious stones, houses and horses and yachts, but none of them at this moment as prized as this glittering trifle. Well, I was marking myself, the general had taken enough of his own good whisky to begin acting out his story, and he made the gesture of crouching down in the bunker and looking up at the targets, and I don't mind telling you that it was the worst hour of my life. Mark smiled in agreement. The Highlander marksmen had matched him shot for shot. Each of them signalled as a bullseye by the flags of the markers. 
They both shot possibles at 200 yards, and then again at 500 yards. It was only at the 1,000-yard targets that young Mark's uncanny ability to judge the crosswind. By this time, Sean's audience was cow-eyed with boredom, and there were still ten rounds of deliberate and another ten of rapid fire to hear about. Mark sensed panic signals across the ballroom, and he looked up. Ruth Courtney was beside the main doors of the ballroom, and with her was the Zulu butler. A man with warrior blood in his veins and the usual bearing of a chief, now he was grey with some emotion, close to fear, and his expression was pitiable as he spoke rapidly to his mistress. Ruth touched his arm in a gesture of comfort and dismissal, and then turned to wait for Mark. As he hurried to her across the empty dance floor, he could not help but notice again how much mother resembled daughter. Ruth Courtney still had the figure of an athletic young woman, kept slim and firm and graceful by hard riding and long walking, and only when he was close to her were the small lines and tiny blemishes in her smooth ivory skin apparent. Her hair was dressed high on her head, scorning the fashionable shorter cut, and her gown had a simple elegance that showed off the lines of her body and the small shapely breasts. One of her guests reached her before Mark did, and she was relaxed and smiling while Mark hovered close at hand until she excused herself and Mark hurried to her. Mark, her worry showed only in her eyes as she looked up at him, towering above her, but her smile was light and steady. There's going to be trouble. We have an unwelcome visitor. Well, what do you want me to do? He's in the entrance hall now. Please take him through to the general study and stay with him until I can warn my husband and send him to you. Will you do that? Of course. She smiled her thanks. And then, as Mark turned away, she stopped him with a touch. Mark, try to stay with them. I don't want them to be alone together. I'm not sure what might happen. Then her reserve cracked. In God's name, why did he have to come here? And tonight, when... She stopped herself then, and the smile firmed on her lips, steady and composed. But they both knew that she had been going to say, Tonight, when Sean has been drinking... Mark now knew the general well enough to share her concern. When Sean Courtney was drinking, he was capable of anything, from genial and expansive bonhomie to dark, violent and undirected rage. Uh, I'll, I'll do what I can, he agreed, and then... Uh, tell me, who is it? Ruth bit her lower lip, the strain and worry clear on her face for a moment before she checked herself, and her expression was neutral when she replied, It's his son, Dirk. Dirk Courtney. Mark's own shock showed so clearly that she frowned at him. What's wrong, Mark? Do you know him? Mark recovered quickly. No, no, I've, I've heard of him, but I, I don't know him. There is bad blood, Mark. Very bad. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. She left him and drifted quietly away across the floor, nodding to a dowager, stopping to exchange a word and a smile and then drifting on to where Sean Courtney still held court in the buffet room. Mark paused in the long gallery, and looked at himself in one of the tall, gilt-framed mirrors. His face looked pale and strained, and when he smoothed his hair, his fingers were trembling slightly. Suddenly he realised that he was afraid. Dread was like a heavy weight in his bowels, and his breathing was cramped and painful. He was afraid of the man he was going to meet the man that he had stalked so long and painstakingly, and who he had come to know so well in his imagination. In his mind he had built up an awesome figure, a diabolic figure wielding great and malignant power, and now he was consumed by dread at the prospect of meeting him face to face. He went on down the gallery, his footsteps deadened by the thick pile of the carpet, his eyes not seeing the art treasures that adorned the panelled walls, for a sense of imminent danger blinded him to all else. At the head of the marble staircase he paused and leaned out with one hand on the balustrade to look down into the entrance hall. A man stood alone in the centre of the black and white chequered marble floor. He wore a black overcoat with a short cape hanging from his shoulders, a garment which enhanced his size. His hands were clasped behind his back and he balanced on the balls of his feet with head and jaw thrust forward aggressively, an attitude so like that of his father that Mark blinked in disbelief. His bare head was a magnificent profusion of dark curls which were shot by the overhead candelabra 
with sparkling chestnut highlights. Mark started down the wide staircase, and the man lifted his head and looked at him. Mark was struck instantly by the man's fine looks, and then immediately afterwards by his resemblance to the general. He had the same powerful jaw, and the shape of his head, the set of his eyes and the lines of his mouth were identical, yet the son was infinitely more handsome than the father. It was the noble head of a Michelangelo statue, the beauty of his David, and the magnificent strength of his Moses. Yet for all his beauty he was human, not the implacable monster of Mark's imagining, and the unreasonable fear released its grip on Mark's chest, and he could smile a small welcoming smile as he came down the steps. Dirk watched him without blinking or moving. And it was only when Mark reached the chequered marble floor that he realised how tall the man was. He towered three inches over Mark, and yet his body was so well proportioned that its height did not seem excessive. Mr Courtney, Mark asked, and the man inclined his head slightly without bothering to reply. The diamond that clasped the white silk cravat at his throat flashed sullenly. Who are you, boy? Dirk Courtney asked, and his voice had the depth and timbre to match his frame. I am the general's personal assistant. Mark did not let the disparaging form of address ruffle his polite smile, though he knew that Dirk Courtney was his senior by less than ten years. Dirk Courtney ran an unhurried glance from his head to his shoes, taking in the cut of Mark's evening dress and every other detail in one casual sweep before dismissing him as unimportant. Where's my father? He turned to adjust his cravat in the nearest mirror. Does he know I've been waiting here for almost twenty minutes? The general is entertaining, but uh, he will see you presently. In the meantime, will you care to wait in the general's study, if you will follow me? Dirk Courtney stood in the middle of the study floor and looked about him. Well, the old boy is keeping grand style these days. He smiled with a flash of startlingly white teeth, and then crossed to one of the studded leather armchairs by the stone fireplace. Get me a brandy and soda, boy. Mark swung open the dummy-fronted bookcase, selected a Courvoisier cognac from the orderly ranks of bottles, poured some into a goblet, squirting soda on top of it, and carried it to Dirk Courtney. He sipped the drink and nodded, sprawling in the big leather chair with the insolent grace of a resting leopard. And then once again he surveyed the room, his gaze checking at each of the paintings, at each of the items of value which decorated the room, was calculating and thoughtful, and he asked his next question carelessly, not really interested in the answer. What did you say your name was? Mark stepped sideways, so that his view of the man's face was uninterrupted, and he watched carefully as he replied. My name is Anders. Mark Anders. For a second, the name had no effect. Then it struck Dirk, and a remarkable transformation passed over his features. Watching it happen, Mark's fear was regenerated in full strength. When he had been a lad, the old man had snared a marauding leopard in a heavy steel spring-tooth trap, and when they had walked up to the site the following morning, the leopard had charged them, coming up short against the heavy retaining chain, within three feet of Mark, and with its eyes almost on a level with his own. He had never forgotten the terrible, blazing malevolence in those eyes. Now he was seeing the same expression, an emotion so murderous and unspeakably evil that he drew back involuntarily. It lasted only an instant, but it seemed that the entire face changed from extravagant beauty to grotesque ugliness and back to beauty in the time it takes to draw breath. Dirk's voice when he spoke was measured and controlled, the eyes veiled and the expression of polite indifference. Anders, I've heard the name before he thought for a moment, as though trying to place it, and then dismissed it as unimportant, his attention returning to the Thomas Baines painting above the fireplace. But in that instant, Mark had learned with complete certainty that the vague, unformed suspicions he had harboured so long were based on hard, cold fact. He knew now, beyond any doubt, that something evil had happened, that the sale of Anders' land and the old man's death and burial in an unmarked grave were the result of deliberate planning, and that the men who had hunted him on the Ladyburg escarpment and again in the wilderness beyond Chagas Gate were all part of a design engineered by this man. 
He knew that at last he had identified his adversary. Yet to hunt him down and bring him to retribution was to be a task that might be beyond his capability. For the adversary seemed invincible in his strength and power. He turned away to tidy the pile of documents on the general's desk, not trusting himself to look again at his enemy, lest he betray himself completely. Already he had exposed himself dangerously, but it had been necessary, an opportunity too heaven-sent to allow to pass. In exchange for exposing himself, he had forced his enemy to do the same. He had forced him into the open, and he counted himself the winner in the exchange. There was another factor now that had made his exposure less than suicidal. Whereas before he had been friendless and alone, now he was protected by his mere association with Sean Courtney. If they had succeeded that night on the Ladyburg Escarpment or again at Charker's Gate, it would be the unimportant passing of a rootless vagrant. Now his death or disappearance would rouse the immediate attention of General Courtney, and he doubted if even Dirk Courtney could afford that risk. Mark looked up quickly from the papers, and Dirk Courtney was watching him again, but now his expression was neutral, and his eyes were hooded and guarded. He began to speak, but checked himself as they heard the heavy dragging tread in the passage, and they both turned expectantly to the door as it was flung open. Sean Courtney seemed to fill the entire doorway, the top of the great shaggy head almost touching the lintel, and the shoulders wide as the cross trees of a gallows, as he leaned both hands on the head of his cane and glared into the room. His eyes went immediately to the tall, elegant figure that rose from the leather armchair, the craggy, sun-brown features darkening with blood as he recognised him. The two men confronted each other silently and Mark found himself a fascinated spectator. As he followed intuitively the play of emotions, the reawakening of the memory of ancient wrongs, and of the elemental love and affection of son for father, and father for son that had so long ago been strangled and buried, but were now exhumed like some loathsome rotting corpse, more horrible for once having lived and been strong. Hello, father. Dirk Courtney spoke first, and at the sound of his voice the rigidity went out of Sean's shoulders and the anger out of his eyes to be replaced by a sense of sadness, of regret for something that had once had value but was lost beyond hope. So his question sounded like a sigh. Why do you come here? Can we speak alone without strangers? Mark left the desk and crossed to the door, but Sean stopped him with a hand on the shoulder. There are no strangers here. Stay, Mark. It was the kindest thing that anybody had ever said to Mark Anders, and the strength of the affection he felt for Sean Courtney at that moment was greater than he had ever felt for another human being. Dirk Courtney shrugged and smiled for the first time, a light, faintly mocking smile. You are always too trusting, father. Sean nodded as he crossed heavily to the chair beyond his desk. Yes, and who should remember that better than you? Dirk's smile faded. I came here hoping that we might forget, that we might look for forgiveness from each other. Forgiveness? Sean asked, looking up quickly. You will grant me forgiveness? For what? You bred me, father. I am what you made me. Sean shook his head, denying it, and would have spoken, but Dirk stopped him. You believe I have wronged you? But I know that you have wronged me. Sean scowled. You talk in circles, come to the point. What do you want that brings you uninvited to this house? I am your son. It is unnatural that we should be parted. Dirk was eloquent and convincing, holding out his hands in a gesture of supplication, moving closer to the massive figure at the desk. I believe I have the right to your consideration. He broke off and glanced at Mark. God damn it, can't I speak to you without this gawking audience? Sean hesitated a moment and was on the point of asking Mark to leave, and then remembered the promise he had made to Ruth only minutes before. Don't let him be alone with you for a moment, Sean. Promise me you will keep Mark with you. I don't trust him, not at all. He is evil, Sean, and he brings trouble and unhappiness. I can smell it on him. Don't be alone with him. No, he shook his head. If you have something to say, get it over with. If not, go and leave us in peace here. All right, no more sentiment, Dirk nodded, and the role of the supplicant dropped from him. He turned and began to stride up and down the study floor, 
hands thrust deep into the pockets of his overcoats. I'll talk business and get it over with. You hate me now, but when we have worked together, when I have shared with you the boldest and most imaginative venture this land has ever known, then we will talk again of sentiment. Sean was silent. There's a businessman now and there's a son later. Do you agree? I hear you, said Sean, and Dirk began to talk. Even Mark could not but stand in admiration of Dirk Courtney's eloquence and the winning and persuasive manner in which he used his fine, deep voice and his magnificent good looks. But these were theatrical tricks, well rehearsed and stagey. What was spontaneous was the burning, almost fanatical glow of commitment to his own ideas which radiated from him as he talked and gestured. It was easy to believe him, for he so clearly believed himself. Using his hands and his voice, he conjured up before his father a vast empire, endless expanses of rich land, thousands upon thousands of square miles, a treasure the likes of which few men had ever conceived, planted to cotton and sugar and maize, watered by a gigantic dam that would hold back an inland sea of sweet fresh water. It was a dream quite breathtaking in its scope and sweep. I have half the land already. Dirk paused and cupped his hands, with fingers stiff and grasping as the talons of an eagle. Here, in my hands, it's mine. No longer a dream. And the rest of it? Sean asked reluctantly, swept along on the torrent against his will. It's there, untouched, ripe, ready. Dirk paused dramatically. It is as though nature had designed it all for just this purpose. The foundations of the dam are there, built by God, as though as a blessing. So, Sean grunted sceptically, now you are an instrument of God's will, are you? And where is this empire he has promised you? I own all the land south of the Amkomo River. That is the half I have already. He stopped in front of the mahogany desk and leaned forward with his hands on the polished wood, thrusting a face that glowed with the aura of religious fanatic towards Sean Courtney. We will build a dam between the cliffs of Sharka's Gate and dam the whole of the Bubezi Valley a lake 160 miles long and 100 miles wide. And we'll open the land between there and the Amkomo River and add it to the land I already own in the south, two million acres of arable and irrigated land. Think of that! Mark stared at Dirk Courtney, utterly appalled by what he had just heard. And then his gaze switched to Sean Courtney appealingly, wanting to hear him reject the whole monstrous idea. That's Tetsy Belt, said Sean Courtney at last. Father, in Germany three men, Dressel, Kurter and Roschel, have just perfected and tested a drug called Germanin, called Germanin, called Germanin, called Germanin. It's a complete cure for tetsy born sleeping sickness. It's so secret still that only a handful of men know about it, Dirk told him eagerly and then went on. Then we will wipe out the tetsy fly in the whole valley. How? Sean asked, and his genuine interest was evident. From the air, flying machines spraying Pythagora extract or other insect killers. It was a staggering concept, and Sean was silent a moment before he asked reluctantly, Has it been done before? No, Dirk smiled at him. But we will do it. You've thought it out. Sean lay back in his chair and groped absently in the humidor for a cigar. Except for one little detail. The Bubezi Valley is a proclaimed area, has been since the time of Chaka, and most of the other ground between the Bubezi and Incomo rivers is either tribal trust land, crown land or forestry reserve. Dirk Courtney lifted a finger at Mark. Get me another brandy, boy. Mark glanced at the general. Shaw nodded slightly and there was silence again while Mark poured the brandy and brought the glass to Dirk. "'You trust him?' Dirk asked his father again, indicating Mark with his head as he accepted the glass. "'Get on with it, man!' snapped Sean irritably, not bothering to answer the question. Dirk saluted his father with the cut-glass tumbler and smiled knowingly. "'You make the laws, father, you and your friends in the cabinet and in the provincial assembly, and you can change them.' That's your end of the bargain. Sean had drawn a swelling chestful of cigar smoke as Dirk spoke, 
and now he let it trickle out so that his head was wreathed in drifting blue smoke as he replied. Let's get this clear. You put up the money and I forced through Parliament legislation repealing the proclamation of these lands we need between Encomo and the Bubezi rivers? And the Bubezi Valley, Dirk cut in. And the Bubezi Valley. Then I arranged that some front company gets control of that land, even if it's only on a thousand-year ground rental. Dirk nodded. Yes, that's it. And what about the cost of the dam and the new railroad to the dam? Have you got that type of capital? Mark could hardly believe what he was hearing, that Sean Courtney was haggling over the assets of the nation, treasures that had been entrusted to him as a high representative of the people. He wanted to shout out, to lash out at them as they schemed. The deep affection he had felt moments before turned slowly to a deep sense of outrage and betrayal. Nobody has that type of capital, father, Dirk told him. I've had my people work out a rough estimate and there will be little change left out of four million pounds. No individual has that sort of money. So, Sean asked, the wreaths of cigar smoke drifted away from his head and it seemed to Mark that he had aged suddenly. His face was grey and haggard, the deep-set eyes turned by a trick of the light into the dark, empty eye sockets of a skull. The government will build them for us and Dirk chuckled richly as he resumed his pacing. Or rather, they'll build dam and railway for the nation to open up valuable natural resources, Dirk chuckled again, <laughs> and imagine the prestige of the man that shepherds these measures through Parliament, the man who brings progress and civilization into the wilderness. He picked up the brandy glass and tossed off half the contents. It would all be named after him. The Sean Courtney Dam, perhaps? It sounds impressive. A fitting monument, father. Dirk lifted the glass to his father. But what of the tribal lands, Dirk? Sean used his son's name for the first time, Mark noticed, and glanced sharply at him. Ah, oh, we'll move the blacks out, Dirk told him casually. Find a place for them in the hills. And the game reserves? Good God, are we going to let a few wild animals stand in the way of a hundred million pounds? He shook the handsome head of curls in mock dismay. Before we flood the valley, you can take a hunting safari there. You always did enjoy the hunt, didn't you? I remember you telling me about the big elephant hunts in the old days. Yes, Sean nodded heavily. I killed a lot of elephant. So, Father, we're agreed then? Dirk stopped once more before Sean, and there was for the first time an anxious air, a small frown of worry puckering his bold high forehead. Do we work together? Sean was silent for seconds longer, staring at the blotter on his desktop, and then he raised his head slowly, and he looked sick and very old. What you have told me, the sheer size of it all, has taken me completely by surprise. He spoke carefully, measuring each word. It's big and it's going to take guts, Dirk agreed. But you've never been frightened before, Father. You told me once, if you want something, you go out and get it. For one thing is as sure as hell, nobody is going to bring it to you. I am older now, Dirk, and a man grows tired, loses the strength of his youth. Ah, you're as strong as a bull. I want time to think about it. How long? Dirk demanded. Until, Sean faltered and thought a moment, until after the next parliamentary sessions, I will need to speak to people, examine the feasibility of the whole idea. Oh, it's too long, Dirk scowled, and suddenly the face was no longer beautiful. The eyes changed, coming together into a mean, ferrety look. It's the time I need. All right, Dirk agreed, and thrust the scowl aside, smiling down at the massive seated figure. He began the gesture of putting out his right hand, but Sean did not look up, and instead he thrust the hand back into his overcoat pocket. I'm neglecting my guests said Sean softly. You must excuse me now. Mark will see you out. You'll let me know? Dirk demanded. Yes, said Sean heavily, still not looking up. I will let you know. Mark led Dirk Courtney down to the front doors, and he felt feverish with anger and hatred for him. They walked in silence side by side, and Mark fought the wild, dark and violent impulses that kept sweeping over him, he hated him for having tarnished the man he had respected and worshipped, 
for having smeared him with his own filth. He hated him for the old man and for Andersland and for the dreadful but unknown deeds he had ordered, and he hated him for what he was about to do to that beloved land beyond Charker's gate. At the front doors, Dirk Courtney took his hat from the table and adjusted it over his eyes as he studied Mark carefully. I'm a good friend to have, he said softly. My father trusts you and I am sure he confides in you. You would find me grateful and generous and I am sure that since you overheard our conversation, you will know what small items of information might interest me. Mark stared at him. His lips felt numb and cold, and his whole body trembled with the effort it took to control himself. He did not trust his own voice to speak. Dirk Courtney turned away abruptly, not bothering with his reply, and he strode lightly down the front steps into the night. Mark stared after him long after he disappeared. There was the crackling snarl of a powerful engine, the crunch of gravel under spinning wheels, and the twin beams of headlights swept the garden and were gone. Mark's feet kept pace with the furious rush of his anger, and he was almost running when he reached the general's study. Without knocking, he pushed open the door. Words threatened to explode out of him, bitter condemnation, accusation and rejection, and he looked to the general's desk, but it was empty. He was going to warn the general that he would use any means to expose the foul bargain that had been proposed that evening. He was going to voice his disillusion, his horror, that Sean Courtney had even listened to it, let alone given it serious thought and the half-promise of his support. The general stood at the window, his back to the room, and the wide, square shoulders slumped. He seemed to have shrunk in size. General! Mark's voice was harsh, strident with his anger and determination. I'm leaving now and I won't be coming back. But before I go, I want to tell you that I will fight you and your son. Sean Courtney turned into the room. His shoulders still drooped and his head held at a listening angle, like that of a blind man. And Mark's voice trailed away, his fury evaporating. Mark? Sean Courtney asked, as though he had forgotten his existence and Mark stared at him, not believing what he was seeing. For Sean Courtney was weeping. Bright tears had swamped and blinded his eyes and streamed down the lined and sun-seared cheeks, clinging in fat, bright droplets to the coarse curls of his beard. It was one of the most distressing sights Mark had ever witnessed, so harrowing that he wanted to turn away from it, but could not. Get me a drink, son. Sean Courtney crossed heavily towards his desk, and one of his tears fell to the starched, snowy front of his dress shirt, leaving a wet mark on the material. Mark turned away and made a show of selecting a glass and pouring whiskey from the heavy decanter. He drew the simple act out, and when he turned back, Sean Courtney was at his desk. He held a crumpled white handkerchief in his hand that had damp patches on it, but although his cheeks were dry now, the rims of his eyelids were pink and inflamed, and the marvellous sparkling blue clarity of his eyes was dulled with swimming liquid. Thank you, Mark, he said, as he set the glass on the desk in front of him. Sean did not touch the glass, but stared at it, and when he spoke his voice was low and husky. I brought him into the world with my own hands. There was no doctor. I caught him in my own hands, still wet and warm and slippery. And I was proud. I carried him on my shoulder and taught him to talk and ride and shoot. There are no words to explain what a man feels for his firstborn son. Sean sighed, a broken, gusty sound. I, I mourned him once before. I mourned him as though he was dead. And that was many years ago. He drank a little of the whiskey and then went on softly, so softly that Mark could hardly hear the words. Now he comes back and forces me to mourn him again, all over again. I'm sorry, General. I, I thought, I, I believed that you, you were going to bargain with him. That thought dishonours me. Sean did not raise his voice nor his eyes. Leave me now, please, Mark. 
We'll talk about this again at some other time. At the door, Mark looked back, but the general was not aware of his presence. His eyes were still misty and seemed to stare at a far horizon. Mark closed the door very softly. Despite Sean Courtney's promise to discuss Dirk Courtney's proposition again, long weeks went by without even the mention of his name. However, though the life at Emoyeni seemed to continue in its busy round, yet there were times when Mark entered the panelled and book-lined study to find the general brooding darkly at his desk, beak-nosed and morbid as some roosting bird of prey, and he withdrew quietly, respecting his melancholy, knowing he was still in mourning. Mark realised it would take time before he was ready to talk. During this period, there were small changes in Mark's own circumstances. One night, long after midnight, Sean Courtney had entered his dressing room to find the lights were still on in the bedroom and Ruth propped on her pillows and reading. You shouldn't have waited up for me, he told her severely. I could have slept on the couch. I prefer you here, she closed the book. What are you reading? She showed him the title. D.H. Lawrence's new novel, Women in Love. Sean grinned as he unbuttoned his shirt. Did he teach you anything? Not yet, but I'm still hoping. She smiled at him, and he thought how young and lovely she looked in her lace nightdress. And you? Did you finish your speech? Yes, he sat to remove his boots. It's a masterpiece. I'm going to tear the bastards to shreds. I heard Mark's motorcycle leaving a few minutes ago. You kept him here until midnight. Uh, he was helping me look up some figures and searching Hansard for me. It's awfully late. Ah, he's young, grunted Sean, and damned well paid for it. He picked up his boots and stumped through into the dressing room, the limp more noticeable now that he was in his stockinged feet. And I haven't heard him complain yet. He came back in his nightshirt and slipped into bed beside her. If you are going to keep the poor boy to these hours, it's not fair to send him back to town every night. Oh, what do you suggest? he asked, as he wound his gold hunter and then placed it on the bedside table. Well, I could turn the gatekeeper's cottage into a flat for him. It wouldn't need much, even though it's been deserted for years. A oh, good idea, Sean agreed casually. Keep him on the premises so I can really get some work out of him. Oh, you're a hard man, General Courtney. He rolled over and kissed her lingeringly, then whispered in her ear, I'm glad you noticed. She giggled like a bride and whispered back, I didn't mean that. Let's see if we can teach you something that Mr. Lawrence could not, he suggested. He suggested. He suggested. He suggested. The cottage, once it was repainted and furnished with discards from the big house, was by Mark's standards palatial and marvellously free of vermin and cockroaches. It was less than half a mile from the main house, and his hours became as irregular as those of his master, his position each day more trusted and naturally integrated into the household. His duties came to cover the entire spectrum, from speech-writing and researching, answering all correspondence that was not important enough for the General's own hand, operating the household accounts, to merely sitting quietly sometimes when Sean Courtney needed somebody to talk to, and acting as a sounding board for arguments and ideas. Yet there was still time for his old love of reading. There were thousands of volumes that made up the library at Emoyeni, and Mark took an armful of them down to the cottage each evening, and read until the early hours, devouring with omnivorous appetite history, biography, satire, political treatise, Zane Grey, Kipling, and Ryder Haggard. Then suddenly there was a new spirit of excitement and upheaval in Emoyeni as the next session of Parliament approached. This meant that the household must uproot itself and move almost a thousand miles south to Cape Town. Likely, Ruth Courtney referred to this annual political migration as the Great Trek, but the description was justified, for it meant moving the family, 15 of the senior servants, three automobiles, a dozen horses, all the clothing, silver, glassware, papers, books, and other incidentals that would be necessary to sustain in the correct style a busy social and political season of many months, while General Courtney and his peers conducted the affairs of the nation. It meant also closing Emoyeni and opening the house in Newlands, below the squat bulk of Table Mountain. In the middle of all this frantic activity, 
Storm Courtney arrived home from the grand tour of the British Isles and the continent, on which she and Irene Luchars had been chaperoned by Irene's mother. In her last letter to Ruth Courtney, Mrs Luchars had admitted herself to be both physically and mentally exhausted. You will never know, my dear, the terrible weight of responsibility I have been under. We have been followed across half the world by droves of eager young men, Americans, Italians, Frenchmen, Counts, Barons, sons of industrialists and even the son of the dictator of a South American republic. The strain was such that at one period I could bear it no longer and lock both the girls in their room. It was only later that I discovered that they had escaped by means of a fire escape and danced until the following morning at some disreputable boîte de nuit in Montparnasse. With the tact of a loving wife, Ruth refrained from showing the letter to Sean Courtney and so he prepared to welcome his daughter with all the enthusiasm of a doting father unclouded by awareness of her recent escapades. Mark was, for once, left out of the family preparations, and he watched from the library window when Sean handed his wife into the rolls. He was dressed like a suitor, in crisply starched flyaway collar, a gay silk cravat, dark blue suit with white carnation in the buttonhole, and a beaver tilted jauntily over one eye. His beard was trimmed and shampooed, and there was a merry anticipatory sparkle in his eyes, and he twirled his cane lightly as he went round to his own seat. The rolls purred away, almost two hours ahead of the time when the mail ship was scheduled to berth at Number One Wharf. It was followed at a respectful distance by the second rolls, which would be needed for the conveyance of Storm Courtney's baggage. Mark lunched alone in the study and then worked on, but his concentration was broken by the imminent arrival of the returning cavalcade, and when it came, he hurried to the windows. He caught only a glimpse of Storm as she left the car and danced up the front steps hand in hand with her mother. They were followed immediately by the general, his cane snapping a staccato beat off the marble as he hurried to match their swiftness. On his face he wore an expression that tried to remain severe and stern, but kept breaking into a wide, beaming grin. Mark heard the laughter and the excited murmur of the servants assembled to greet her in the entrance hall, and Storm's voice giving a new sweet lilt to the cadence of the Zulu language as she went to each of them in turn. Mark returned to his open books, but did not look down at them. Instead, he was savouring that one glimpse he had had of Storm. She had grown somehow lovelier. He had not believed it possible, but it had happened. It was as though the divine essence of young womanhood had been distilled in her. All the gaiety and grace, all the warmth and smoothness, the texture of skin and silken hair, the perfect moulding of limb and the delicate sculpturing of feature, the musical lilt of her voice, clear as the ring of crystal, the dancing grace of her movements, the very carriage of the small, perfect head on bare brown shoulders. Mark sat bemused, acutely aware of the way in which the whole huge house had changed its mood since she entered it, and become charged with her spirit as though it had been waiting for this moment. Mark had excused himself from dinner that evening, not wanting to intrude on the family's first evening together. He intended going down to the drill hall for the weekly muster, and afterwards he would dine with some of the other young bachelor officers. At four o'clock he left the house through a side entrance and went down to the cottage to bath and change into his uniform. He was thundering out of the gates of Emoyeni on the aerial square four when he remembered that the general had asked for the railway report to be left on his desk. In the distraction of Storm's arrival, he had forgotten it, and now he swung the heavy machine into a tight turn and tore back up the driveway. In the paved kitchen yard, he pulled the motorcycle up on its stand and went in through the back door. He was standing at the library table with the report in his hands, glancing through it quickly to check his own notations, when suddenly the latch on the door clicked. He laid aside the report and turned just as the door swung open. This close, Storm Courtney was lovelier still. She was three quick, light paces into the room before she realised she was not alone, and she paused, startled, poised with the grace of a gazelle on the point of flight. One hand flew to her mouth, and her fingers were delicately tapered with long nails that gleamed like pink mother of pearl. She touched her lips with the tip of one finger. The lip trembled slightly, wet and smooth and glistening, and her eyes were huge and dark, fearful blue. She looked like a little girl, frightened and alone. 
Mark wanted to reassure her, to protect her from her own distress, to say something to comfort her, but he found he could not move or speak. He need not have worried. Her distress lasted only a fleeting beat of time, just long enough for her to realise that the source of her alarm was a tall young man, dashing in the dress and uniform he wore, a uniform that set off the slim, graceful body, a uniform emblazoned with badges of courage and of responsibility. Subtly, with barely a shadow of movement, her whole poise changed. The finger on her lip now touched one cheek with an arch gesture, and the trembling lip stilled and parted slightly into a thoughtful pout. The huge eyes, no longer fearful, almost disappeared behind drooping lids, and then examined Mark critically, lifting her chin to look up into his face. Her stance changed also, one hip thrusting forward an inch, the twin mounds of her breasts lifting and pressing boldly against the gossamer silk of her bodice. The tender, taunting line of her lips was enough to make Mark's breath catch in his throat. Hello, she said. Her voice, although low and throaty, bounced the word off Mark's heart, drawing it out into two syllables that seemed to hang in the air seconds later. Good evening, Miss Courtney, he answered her, surprised that his voice came out level and assured. It was the voice that triggered her memory, and the blue eyes flew wide as she stared at him. Slowly, her surprise turned to angry outrage. The eyes snapped sparks, and two bright scarlet blotches of crimson burned suddenly, on the smooth, almost waxy perfection of her cheeks. You? she asked incredulously. Here? I'm afraid so, he agreed, and her consternation was so comical that he grinned at her, his own misgivings evaporating. Suddenly he felt relaxed and at his ease. What are you doing in this house? She drew herself up to her full height, and her manner became frostily dignified. The full effect was spoiled by the fact that she had to look up at him, and that her cheeks still burned with agitation. I am your father's personal assistant now, and he smiled again. However, I'm sure you will soon become reconciled to my presence. We will see about that, she snapped. I shall speak to my father. Oh, well, I was led to understand that you and the general had already discussed my employment, or rather, my unemployment. I, said Storm, and then closed her mouth firmly the colour spreading from her cheeks down her throat, as she remembered with sudden acute discomfort the whole episode. The humiliation was still so intense that she felt herself wilting like a rose on a summer's day, and a small choke of self-pity constricted the back of her throat. It was enough that it had happened, that instead of her father's unquestioning support, something she had been accustomed to since her first childhood memories, he had told her angrily that she had acted like a spoiled child, that she had shamed him by misusing his power and influence, and that the shame had been made more intense by the way she had used it without his knowledge, by sneaking behind his back, as he put it. She had been frightened, as she always was by his anger, but not seriously disturbed. It was almost ten years since he had last lifted a hand to her. A true lady shows consideration to all around her, no matter what their colour or creed or station. She had heard it often before, and now her fear was turning to irritation. Oh, la da Pater, I'm not a child any more, she flounced. He was insolent, and anybody who is insolent to me will damn well pay for it. You have made two statements there, the general noted with deceptive calm, and both of them need correction. If you are insolent, then you will get back insolence. And you are a child still. He rose from his chair behind the desk and he was huge, like a forest oak, like a mountain. One other little thing. Ladies do not swear, and you are going to be a lady when you grow up, even if I have to beat it into you. As he took her wrist, she suddenly realised with a sense of incredulous dismay what was about to happen. It had not happened since she was fourteen years of age, and she had believed it would never happen again. She tried to pull away, but his strength was enormous, and as he lifted her easily under one arm and carried her to the leather couch, she let out her first squeal of fear and outrage. It changed swiftly to real anguished howls as he positioned her carefully across his lap and swept her skirts up over her head. Her pantaloons were of blue crepe de chine, 
with little pink roses decorating the target area, and his palm, horny and hard, snapped over the tight double bulge of her buttocks with a sharp rubbery crack. He kept it up until the howling and kicking subsided into heart-racking sobs, and then he lowered her skirts and told her quietly, If I knew where to find him, I'd send you to apologise to that young man. Storm remembered that threat and felt a moment of panic. She knew her father was still quite capable of making her apologise, even now, and she nearly turned and rushed out of the library. It required a supreme effort once more to draw herself up and lift her chin defiantly. You are right, she said coldly. The hiring and firing of my father's servants is not a subject with which I should concern myself. Now, if you'd kindly stand aside. Of course, forgive me. Still smiling, Mark bowed extravagantly and made way for her to pass. She tossed her head and swished her skirts as she passed him, and in her agitation went to the wrong shelves. It was some little time before she realised that she was studying intently a row of bound copies of ten-year-old parliamentary white papers, but she would not admit her mistake and humiliate herself further. Furiously she pondered her next sally, picking and discarding half a dozen disparaging remarks before settling on. I would be obliged if in future you would address me only when it is absolutely necessary, and right at this moment I should like to be alone. She spoke without interrupting her perusal of the white papers. There was no reply, and she turned haughtily. Did you hear what I said? Then she paused. She was alone. He had gone silently, and she had not even heard the click of the latch. He had not waited to be dismissed, and Storm felt quite dizzy with anger. Now a whole parade of brilliant and biting insults came readily to her lips, and frustration spiced her anger. She had to do something to vent it, and she looked around for something to break, and then remembered just in time that it was Sean Courtney's library, and everything in it was treasured. So instead she racked her brain for its foulest oath. Bloody hell! she stamped her foot and it was entirely inadequate. Suddenly she remembered her father's favourite. The bastard, she added, rolling it thunderously around her tongue, as Sean did, and immediately she felt better. She said it again, and her anger subsided, leaving an extraordinary new sensation. There was a disturbing heat in that mysterious area between navel and knees. Flustered and alarmed, she hurried out into the garden, the short, glowing tropical dusk gave the familiar lawns and trees an unreal stage-like appearance, and she found herself almost running over the spongy turf, as though to escape from her own sensations. She stopped beside the lake, and her breathing was quick and shallow, not entirely from her exertions. She leaned on the railing of the bridge, and in the rosy light of sunset her reflection was perfectly mirrored in the still pearly waters. Now that the disturbing new sensation had passed, she found herself regretting that she had fled from it. Something like that was what she had hoped for when... She found herself thinking again of that awkward and embarrassing episode in Monte Carlo. Goaded on by Irene Duchars, teased and tempted, she had been made to feel inadequate because she lacked the experience of men that Irene boasted of. Chiefly to spite Irene and to defend herself against her jibes, she had slipped away from the casino with the young Italian count and made no protest when he parked the Bugatti among the pine trees on the high-level road above Cap Ferra. Cap Ferra. Cap Ferra. Cap Ferra. She had hoped for something wild and beautiful, something to bring the moon crashing out of the sky and to make choirs of angels sing. It had been quick, painful and messy and neither she nor the Count had spoken to each other on the winding road down to Nice, except to mutter goodbye on the pavement outside the Negresco Hotel. She had not seen him again. Why she thought of this now, she could not understand, and she thrust the memory aside without effort. It was replaced almost instantly with a picture of a tall young man in a handsome uniform, of a cool, mocking smile and calm, penetrating gaze. Immediately she was aware of the warmth and glow in her lower belly again, and this time she did not attempt to fly from it, but continued leaning on the bridge, smiling at her darkening image in the water. You look like a smug old pussycat, she whispered, and chuckled softly. Sean Courtney rode like a boar, 
with long stirrups, sitting well back in the saddle with legs thrust in a straight line in front of him, and the reins held loosely in his left hand, the black quirt of hippo hide dangling from its thong on his wrist, so that the point touched the ground. His favourite mount was a big raw-boned stallion of almost eighteen hands with a white blaze and an ugly, unpredictable nature that only the general could fathom. But even he had to use the occasional light cut with the quirt to remind the beast of his social obligations. Mark had an English seat, or, as the general put it, rode like a monkey on a broomstick. And he added darkly, After only a hundred miles or so perched up like that, your backside will be so hot you could cook your dinner on it. We rode a thousand miles in two weeks when we were chasing General LaRue. They rode almost daily together, when even the huge rooms of Emoyeni became confining, and the general started to fret at the caging of his big body. Then he would shout for the horses. There were thousands of acres of open ground still backing the big urban estates, and then beyond that there were hundreds of miles of red dirt roads crisscrossing the sugarcane fields. As they rode, the day's work was continued, with only the occasional interruption for a half mile of hard galloping to charge the blood, and then the general would rein in again and they would amble on over the gently undulating hills, knee to knee. Mark carried a small leather-bound notebook in his inside pocket to make notes of what he must write up on their return, but most of it he carried in his head. The week before the departure to Cape Town had been filled with the implementation of details and of broad policies. The winding up of the domestic business of the Provincial Legislative Council before beginning on the national business of Parliament, and deep in this discussion their daily ride had carried them further than they had ridden together before. When at last the General reined in, they had reached the crest of a hill, and the view before them spread down to the sea and away to the far silhouette of the great whale-backed mountain above Durban Harbour. Directly below them, a fresh scar had been torn in the earth, like a bold knife stroke through the green carpet of vegetation into the red fleshy earth. The steel tracks of the permanent way had reached this far, and as they sat the fidgeting horses, the loco came huffing up to the railhead, pushing the track carrier ahead of it under its heavy load of steel. Neither of them spoke as the tracks were dumped with a faint clattering roar, and the tiny ant-like figures of the track-laying gang swarmed over them, manhandling them onto the orderly parallel rows of timber sleepers. The tap of the swinging hammers began then, a quick rhythmic beat as the fish plates were spiked into place. A mile a day, said Sean softly, and Mark saw from his expression that he was thinking once again of another railroad far to the north, and all that it betokened. Cecil Rhodes dreamed of a railway from Cairo to Cape Town, and I believed once that it was a grand dream. He shook his beard heavily. God knows, perhaps we were both wrong. He turned the stallion's head away, and they walked back down the hill in silence, except for the jingle of harness and the clip of hooves. They were both thinking of Dirk Courtney, but it was another ten minutes before Sean spoke. Do you know the Bubezi Valley beyond Chagas Gate? Yes, said Mark. Tell me, Sean ordered, and then went on. It's fifty years since I was last there. During the war with the old Zulu king Kechwayo, we chased the remains of his impis up there and hunted them along the river. I was there only a few months ago, just before I came to you. Sean turned in the saddle, and his black brows came together sharply. What were you doing there? he demanded harshly. For an instant, Mark was about to blurt out all his suspicions of Dirk Courtney, of the fate that had overtaken the old man, of his pilgrimage to find the grave and to fathom the mystery beyond Charker's gate. Something warned him that to do so would be to alienate Sean Courtney completely. He knew enough about him now to realise that although he might accuse and even reject his own son, he would not listen to nor tolerate those accusations from someone outside the family, particularly if those accusations were without substance or proof. Mark put the temptation aside, and instead he explained quietly, My grandfather and I were there often when I was a child. I needed to go back, for the silence and the beauty, for the peace. Yes, the general understood immediately. What's the game like there now? Sin, Mark answered. 
It's been shot out, trapped and hunted. It's thin and very wild. Buffalo? Yes, there are some in the swamps. I think they graze out into the bush in the night, but I never saw them. In 1901, old Saluce wrote that the Cape Buffalo was extinct. That was after the Rinderpest Plague. My God, Mark, when I was your age, there were herds of ten and twenty thousand together. The plains along the Limpopo were black with them. And he began to reminisce again. It might have been boring, an old man's musty memories, but he told it so vividly that Mark was carried along, fascinated by the tales of a land where a man could ride with his wagons for six months without meeting another white man. It was with a sick little slide of regret, of something irretrievably lost, that he heard the general say, It's all gone now. The railway line is right through to the Copper Belt in northern Rhodesia. Rhodes's column has taken up the land between the Zambezi and the Limpopa. Where I camped and hunted, there are towns and mines, and they are ploughing up the old elephant grounds. He shook his head again. He thought it would never end. And now it's almost gone. He was silent and sad again for a while. My grandchildren may never see an elephant or hear the roar of a lion. My grandfather said that when Africa lost its game, he would go back and live in old London town. There, yeah, well, that's how I feel, Sean agreed. It's strange, but perhaps Dirk has done something of great value for Africa and for mankind. The name seemed to choke in his throat, as though it was an effort to enunciate it, and Mark was silent, respecting that effort. He has made me think of all this as never before. One of the things that we are going to do during the session of Parliament, Mark, is to make sure that the sanctuary in the Bubezi Valley is ratified, and we are going to get funds to administer it properly to make sure that nobody, nobody, ever, turns it into sugarcane or cotton field, or floods it beneath the waters of a dam. As he spoke, Mark listened with a soaring sense of destiny and commitment. It was as though he had waited all his life to hear these words. The general went on, working out what was needed in money and men, deciding where he would lobby for support, which others in the cabinet could be relied on, the form which the legislation must take. And Mark made a note of each point as it came up, his pencil hurrying to keep pace with the general's random and eclectic thoughts. Suddenly, in full intellectual flight, the general broke off and laughed aloud. Ah, it's true, you know, Mark. There is nobody so virtuous as a reformed whore. <laughs> we were the great robber barons, Rhodes and Robertson, Bailey and Bernardo, Duff Charliewood and Sean Courtney. We seized the land and then ripped the gold out of the earth. We hunted where we pleased and burned the finest timber for our campfires. Every man with a rifle in his hand and shoes on his feet was a king, prepared to fight anybody, Boer, Briton or Zulu, for the right of plunder. He shook his head and groped in his pockets before he found his cigars. He laughed no longer, but frowned as he lit the cigar. The big stallion seemed to sense his mood, and he crabbed and bucked awkwardly. Sean rode him easily and quoted him lightly across the flank. Oh, behave yourself, he growled. And then when he quieted, Sean went on. The day that I met my first wife, only 32 years ago, I hunted with her father and her brother. We rode down a herd of elephant, and between the three of us we shot and killed 43 of them. We cut out the tusks and left the carcasses lying. That is over one hundred and sixty tons of flesh. Again he shook his head. Only now am I coming to realise the enormity of what we did. And there were other things. During the Zulu Wars, during the war with Kruger, during Bombata's rebellion in 1906, the things I don't even like to remember. And now perhaps it's too late to make amends. Perhaps also it's just the way of growing old that a man regrets the passing of the old ways. He initiates change, and when he's young, and then mourns that change when he grows old. Mark was silent, not daring to say a word that might break the mood. He knew that what he was hearing was so important that he could then only guess at the depths of it. We must try, Mark. We must try. Yes, sir, we will, Mark agreed, 
and something in his tone made the general glance across at him, mildly surprised. This really means something to you? He nodded, confirming his statement. Yes, yeah, I can see that. Strange a young fellow like you. When I was your age, all I ever thought about was a quick sovereign and a likely piece of... <laughs> he caught himself before he finished, and coughed to clear his throat. Well, sir, you must remember that I had my full share of destruction at an earlier age than you did. The greatest destruction the world has ever known. The general's face darkened as he remembered what they had shared together in France. When you've seen how easy it is to tear down, it makes the preservation seem worthwhile, Mark chuckled ruefully. Oh, perhaps I was born too late. No, said the general softly. And I think you were born just in time. And he might have gone on. But high and clear on the heat-hushed air came the musical cry of a girl's voice, and instantly the general's head went up and his expression lightened. Storm Courtney came at the gallop. She rode with the same light, lithe grace which marked all she did. She rode astride, and she wore knee-high boots with baggy gaucho pants tucked into the tops, a hand-embroidered waistcoat in vivid colours over a shirt of white satin, with wide sleeves and a black, wide-brimmed vaquero hat, hung on her back from a thong around her throat. She reined in beside her father, laughing and flushed, tossing the hair out of her face and leaning out of the saddle to kiss him, not even glancing at Mark, and he touched his reins and dropped back tactfully. "'We've been looking for you all over, Pater,' she cried. "'We went as far as the river. What made you come this way?' Coming up more sedately behind Storm on a bay mare was the blonde girl whom Mark remembered from that fateful day at the tennis courts. She was more conventionally dressed than Storm, in dove-grey riding breeches and tailored jacket, and the wind ruffled the pale silken gold of her cropped hair. While she made her greetings to the general, her eyes kept swivelling in Mark's direction, and he searched for her name and remembered she had been called Irene and realised she must be the girl who had been Storm's companion on the Grand Continental Tour, a pretty bright little thing with a gay, brittle style and calculating eyes. Good afternoon, Miss Lachars. Oh, la! She smiled archly at him now. Um, have we met? Somehow her mare was kneed away from the leading pair and dropped back beside Mark's mount. Uh, briefly, yes, um, we have, Mark admitted. And suddenly the china-blue eyes flew wide, and the girl covered her mouth with a gloved hand. You're the... you're the one! Oh! And she squealed softly with delight, and mimicked him. Just as soon as you say please. Storm Courtney had not looked around, and she was paying exaggerated attention to her father. But Mark watched her small, perfect ears turn pink. She tossed her head again, but this time with an aggressive, angry motion. I think we might forget that, Mark murmured. Forget it, chirped Irene. I'll never forget it. It was absolutely classic. She leaned over and placed a bold hand on Mark's forearm. At that moment, Storm could contain herself no longer. She swivelled in the saddle and was about to speak to Irene when she saw the hand on Mark's arm. For a moment, Storm's expression was ferocious, and the dark blue eyes snapped with an electric sparkle. Irene held her gaze undaunted, making her own paler blue eyes wide and artless, and deliberately, challengingly, she let her hand linger, squeezing lightly on Mark's sleeve. Mark's sleeve. Mark's sleeve. Mark's sleeve. The understanding between the two girls was instantaneous. They had played the game before, but this time, intuitively, Irene realised that she had never been in a stronger position to inflict punishment. She had never seen such a swift and utterly malevolent reaction from Storm, and they knew each other intimately. This time she had Missy Storm in a vice, and she was going to squeeze and squeeze. She edged her mare in until her knee touched Mark's, and she turned away from Storm, deliberately looking up at the rider beside her. I hadn't realised you were so tall, she murmured. How tall are you? Six foot two. Mark only dimly realised that something mysterious, which promised him many awkward moments, was afoot. Oh, I do think height gives a man presence. Storm was now laughing gaily with her father, and trying to listen to the conversation behind her at the same time. Anger clawed her cruelly, and she clutched the riding crop until her fingers ached. She was not quite sure what had affected her this way, 
but she would have delighted in lashing the crop across Irene's silly, simpering face. It was certainly not that she felt anything for Mark Anders. He was, after all, merely a hired servant at Emoyeni. He could make an idiot of himself over Irene Lachard's, and she would not even glance aside at any other time or place. It was just that there were some things that were not done. The dignity of her position, of her father and family. Yes, that was it, she realised. It was an insult that Irene Luchars, as a guest in the Courtney home, should make herself free, should flaunt herself, should make it so blatant that she would like to lead Mark Anders along the well-travelled pathway to her steamy. She could not continue the thought, for the vivid mental image of that pale, deceptively fragile-looking body of Irene spread out, languid and naked, and Mark about to... Another wave of anger made her sway in the saddle, and she dropped the riding crop she carried and turned quickly. Oh, Mark, I've dropped my crop. Won't you be a dear and fetch it for me? Mark was taken aback, not only by the endearment, but also by the stunning smile and warmth of Storm's voice. He almost fell from the saddle in his haste, and when he came alongside Storm to hand the crop back to her, she detained him with a smile of thanks and a question. Mark, won't you help me label my cases? It's only a few days, and we'll all be leaving for Cape Town. I'm so looking forward to it also, Irene agreed, as she pushed her mare up on Mark's other side, and Storm smiled sweetly at her. It should be fun, she agreed. I love Cape Town. Grand fun, Irene laughed gaily, and Storm regretted bitterly the invitation that would make her a guest for four months in the Courtney's Cape Town home. Before Storm could find a cutting rejoinder, Irene leaned across to Mark. Come on, then, she said, and turned her mare aside. Where are you going? Storm demanded. Mark is taking me down to the river to show me the monument where Dick King crossed on his way to fetch the English troops from Grahamstown. Oh, Irene, darling, Storm dabbed at her eye with the tail of her scarf. I seem to have something in my eye. Won't you see to it? No, don't wait for us, Mark. Go on ahead with the general. I know he needs you still and she turned her small, perfect head to Irene for her ministrations. With patent relief, Mark spurred ahead to catch up with the general, and Irene told Storm in honeyed tones, There's nothing in your eye, darling, except a touch of green. You bitch, hissed Storm. Darling, I don't know what you mean. The Dunnater Castle trembled under the thrust of her engines and ran southwards over a starlit sea that seemed to be sculpted from wet black obsidian. Each crest marched with such weighty dignity as to seem solid and unmoving. It was only when the ship put her sharp prow into them that they burst into creaming white and hissed back along the speeding hull. The general paused and looked at the southern sky to where the great cross burned among its myriad cohorts, and Orion the hunter brandished his sword. That's the way the sky should be, he nodded his approval. I could never get used to the northern skies. It was as though the universe had disintegrated, and the grand designs of nature had been plunged into anarchy. They went to the rail and paused there to watch the moon rise out of the dark sea. And as it pushed its golden dome clear of the horizon, the general pulled out the old gold hunter watch from his waistcoat pocket and grunted. At twenty-one minutes past midnight, and the moon is punctual this morning. Mark smiled at the little joke. Yet he knew that it was part of the general's daily ritual to consult his almanac for sunrise and moonrise and the moon phases. The man's energy was formidable. They had worked until just a few minutes previously, and had been at it since mid-morning. Mark felt muzzy and woolly-headed with mental effort and the pungent incense of the general's cigars which had filled the suite. I think we overdid it a little today, my boy, Sean Courtney admitted, as though he had read the thought. Uh, but I did want to be up to date before we dock in Table Bay. Thank you, Mark. Now, why don't you go down and join the dancing? From the boat deck, Mark looked down onto the swirling, orderly confusion of dancing couples in the break of the promenade deck. The ship's band was belting out a Strauss waltz, and the dancers spun wildly, the women's skirts flaring open like the petals of exotic blooms, and their laughing cries a sweet and musical counterpoint to the stirring strains of the waltz. Mark picked Storm Courtney out of the press, her particular grace making it easy to distinguish her. 
She lay back in the circle of her partner's arms and spun dizzily, the light catching the dark sparkle of her hair and glowing on the waxy golden perfection of her bare shoulders. Mark lit a cigarette and leaned on the rail, watching her. It was strange that he had seldom felt lonely in the great silences and space of the wilderness, and here, surrounded by music and gaiety and the laughter of young people, he knew deep loneliness. The general's suggestion that he go down and join the dancing had been unwittingly cruel. He would have been out of place there among the rich young clique who had known each other since childhood, a close-knit elite that jealously closed ranks against any intruder, especially one that did not possess the necessary qualifications of wealth and social standing. He imagined going down and asking Storm Courtney for a waltz, her humiliation at being accosted by her father's secretary, the nudging and the snide exchanges, the patronising questions. Do you actually type letters, old boy? And he felt himself flushing angrily at the mere thought of it. Yet he lingered by the rail for another half hour, delighting in each glimpse of storm and hating each of her partners with a stony, implacable hatred. And when at last he went down to his cabin, he could not sleep. He wrote a letter to Marion Littlejohn and found himself as warmly disposed towards her as he had been in months. Her gentleness and sincerity and the genuineness of her affection for him were suddenly very precious assets. On the pages he recalled the visit she had made to Durban just before his departure. The general had been understanding, and they had had many hours together during the two days. She had been awed by his new position and impressed by his surroundings. However, their one further attempt at physical intimacy, even though it had been made in the security and privacy of Mark's cottage, had been, if anything, less successful than the first. There had been no opportunity, nor had Mark had the heart to break off their engagement. And in the end, Mark had put her on the train to Ladyburg with relief. But now loneliness and distance had enhanced her memory. He wrote with real affection and sincerity, but when he had sealed the envelope, he found that he still had no desire for sleep. He had found a copy of Jock of the Bushfelt in the ship's library and was rereading the adventures of a man and dog and the nostalgic and vivid descriptions of African bush and animals with such pleasure that his loneliness was forgotten. There was a light tap on the door of his cabin. Oh, Mark, do let me hide in here for a moment, Irene Lachars pushed quickly past him before he could protest, and she ordered, Quickly, quickly, lock the door. Her tone made him obey immediately, but when he turned back to her, he had immediate misgivings. She had been drinking. The flush of her cheeks was not all rouge. The glitter in her eyes was feverish, and when she laughed it was unnaturally high. What's the trouble? he asked. Oh, God, darling, I've had the most dreadful time. That Charlie Eastman is absolutely hounding me. I swear I'm terrified to go back to my cabin. I'll talk to him, Mark offered, but she stopped him quickly. Oh, don't make a scene. He's not worth it. She flicked the tail of the ostrich feather boa over her shoulder. I'll just sit here for a while, if you don't mind. Her dress was made of layers of filmy material that floated in a cloud about her as she moved, and her shoulders were bare, the bodice cut so low that her breasts bulged out, very round and smooth and white and deeply divided. Do you mind? she demanded, very aware of the direction of his eyes, and he lifted them quickly to her face. She made a mow of impatience as she waited for his reply. Her lipstick was startling crimson and glossy, so that her lips had a full ripe look. He knew he must get her out of his cabin. He knew that he was in danger. He knew how vulnerable he was, how powerful her family, and he guessed how shallow and callous she could be. But he was lonely, achingly, grindingly lonely. You can stay, of course, he told her, and she drooped her eyelids and ran a sharp pink tongue across the painted lips. Have you got a drink, darling? No, I'm sorry. Don't be. Don't ever be sorry. She swayed against him, and he could smell the liquor on her breath. But it was not offensive, and with her perfume blended into a spicy fragrance. Look, she told him, holding up the silver evening bag she carried. The it girl with every home comfort. And she took a small silver jewelled flask from the bag. Every comfort known to man, she repeated and parted her lips in a lewd but intensely provocative pout. "'Come, and I'll give you a little sample,' her voice dropped to a husky whisper, 
and then she laughed and swirled away in a waltzing turn, humming a bar of the blue Danube, and the gossamer of her skirts floated about her thighs. Clad in silk, her limbs gleamed in the soft light, and when she dropped carelessly onto Mark's bunk, her skirts ballooned and then settled so high that he could see that the black elastic suspender belt that held her stocking tops was decorated with embroidered butterflies. The butterflies were spangled with brilliant colour, and in exotic contrast to the pale, soft skin of her inner thighs. Come, Marky, come and have a little itsy-bitsy drinky. She patted the bunk beside her, and then wriggled her bottom across to make room for him. The skirts rucked up higher, and exposed the wedge of her panties between her thighs. The material was so sheer that he could see the pale red-gold curls trapped and flattened by the silk. Mark felt something crack inside him. For another moment he tried to reckon consequence, to force himself back onto the course that was both moral and safe, but he knew that in reality the decision had been made when he had allowed her to stay. Come, Mark, she held the flask like bait, and the light reflected off in silver splinters that she played into his eyes. The crack opened, and like a bursting dam, all restraint was swept aside. She recognised the moment, and her eyes flared with triumph, and she welcomed him to the bed with a little animal squeal, and with slim, pale arms that wrapped about his neck with startling strength. She was small and strong, quick and demanding, and as skilled as Helena MacDonald. But she was different, so very different. Her youth gave her flesh and sweetness and freshness, her skin an unblemished lustre, a luscious plasticity that was made more startling by her pale pigmentation. When she slipped the strap off one shoulder and popped one of her glossy breasts out on the top of her bodice, offering it to Mark with a sound in her throat which was like the purr of a cat, he gasped aloud. It was white as porcelain and had the same sheen, too large for the slim, fragile body, but hard and firm and springy to his touch. The nipple was tiny, set like a small jewel in the perfect coin of its oreo, so pale and delicate pink when he remembered Helena, dark and puckered and sprinkled with sparse black hair. Wait, Mark, wait, she chuckled breathlessly, and stood quickly to drop the boa and dress to the cabin floor in one quick movement, and then to slip the sheer underwear to her ankles and kick it carelessly aside. She lifted her hands above her head and twirled slowly in front of him. Yes? she asked. Yes, he agreed. Oh, very much yes. Her body was hairless and smooth except for that pale red mist that hazed the fat mound at the base of her belly, and her breasts rode high and arrogant. She came back to him, kneeling over him. There, she whispered. There's a good boy, she crooned but her hands were busy, unbuckling, unbuttoning, questing, finding. And then it was her turn to gasp. Oh, Mark, you clever boy, all by yourself, too. No, he laughed. <laughs> I had a little help. And you're going to get a lot more, she promised, and dropped her soft, fluffy, golden head over him. He thought that her mouth was as red and voracious as one of those low-tied rock-pool anemones, that he had fed with such delight as a child, watching it softly enfold each titbit, sucking it in deeply. Oh, God, he croaked, for her mouth was hot, hotter and deeper than any sea animal could ever be. Irene Lachaz carried her shoes in one hand and the feather boa hung over her other arm and trailed on the floor behind her. Her hair stood out in a soft, pale halo around her head, and her eyes were underlined by dark blue smudges of sleeplessness, while the outline of her mouth was smudged and blurred, her lips puffed and inflamed. God, she whispered, I'm still tiddly. <laughs> and she giggled, and lurched unsteadily to the roll of the ship. Then she pulled up the strap which had slipped from her shoulder. Behind her, in the long passageway, there was a clatter of china, and she glanced back, startled. One of the white-jacketed stewards was pushing a trolley of cups and pots towards her. The morning ritual of tea and biscuits was beginning, and she had not realised the hour. Irene hurried away, turning the corner from the steward's sly and knowing grin, and she reached the door of Storm Courtney's cabin without another encounter. She hammered on the door with the heel of one shoe, but it was a full five minutes before the door swung open, and Storm looked out at her, 
a gown wrapped around her shoulders and her big dark eyes owlish from sleep. Irene, are you crazy? she asked. It's still night. Then she saw Irene's attire and smelled the rich perfume of her breath. Where on earth have you been? Irene pushed the door open and almost tripped over the threshold. You're drunk, accused Storm resignedly, closing the door behind her. No, Irene shook her head. It isn't liquor, it's ecstasy. Where have you been? Storm asked again. I thought you were in bed hours ago. I have flown to the moon, intoned Irene dramatically. I have run barefooted through the stars. I have soared on angels' wings above the mountain peaks. Storm laughed, coming fully awake now. As beautiful, even déshabillé, as Irene would never be. So graceful and lovely that Irene hated her again. She savoured the moment, drawing out the pleasure of anticipation. Where have you been, you mad, bad woman? Storm started to catch the spirit of the moment. Tell all. Through the gates of paradise, to the land of never-never, on the continent of always. Irene's smile became sharp, spiteful and venomous. In short, darling, Mark Anders has been bouncing me like a rubber ball. And the expression on Storm Courtney's face gave her the most intense satisfaction she had known in her whole life. On the third day of January, the Chamber of Mines deliberately tore up the agreement that it had come to with your union to maintain the status quo. It tore that agreement to a thousand pieces and flung them in the faces of the workers. Fergus MacDonald spoke with a controlled icy fury that carried to every corner of the Great Hall, and it stilled even the rowdies in the back seats who had brought their bottles in brown paper packets. Now they listened with intensity. Big Harry Fisher, sitting beside him on the dais, turned his head slowly to assess the man, peering at him under beetling eyebrows and with the bulldog folds of his face hanging mournfully. He marvelled again at how Fergus MacDonald changed when he stood to speak. Usually he cut a nondescript figure with a small bulge of a paunch beginning to distort the spare frame, the cheap and ill-fitting suit shiny at the elbows and seat with wear, the collar of the frayed shirt darned, the grease spots on the drab necktie. His hair was thinning, starting up in wispy spikes around the neck, pushing back from the brow and with a pink bare patch in the crown. His face had that grey tone from the embedded filth of the machine shops. But when he stood under the red flag and the emblem of the Amalgamated Mine Workers Union on the raised dais facing the packed hall, he grew in stature, a physical phenomenon that was quite extraordinary. He seemed younger, and there was a fierce and smouldering passion which stripped away his shoddy dress and armoured him with presents. Brothers, he raised his voice now, when the mines reopened after the Christmas recess, two thousand of our members were discharged, thrown out into the street, discarded like worn-out pairs of old boots. The hall hummed, the warning sound of a beehive on a hot summer's day, but the stillness of thousands of bodies pressed closely together was more menacing than any movement. Brothers, Fergus moved his hands in a slow, hypnotic movement. Brothers, beginning at the end of this month, and for every month after that, another 600 men will be... He paused again and then spat the official word at them. Retrenched! They seemed to reel with the word. The whole concourse stunned as though by a physical blow, and the silence drew out until a voice at the back yelled wildly, No, brothers, no! They roared then, a sound like the surf on a stormy day when it breaks upon a rocky shore. Fergus let them roar. And he hooked his thumbs into his rumpled waistcoat and watched them, gloating in the feeling of exultation, the euphoria of power. He judged the strength of their reaction, and the moment it began to falter he raised both hands and almost immediately the silence fell upon the hall again. Brothers, do you know that the wages of a black man are two shillings and tuppence a day? Only a black man can live on that wage, he let it sink in a moment, but not too long before he went on, asking a reasonable question. Who will take the place of 2,000 of our brothers, who are now out of work? Who will replace the 600 that will join them at the end of this month, and the next, and the next? Who will take your job? He was picking out individuals, pointing at them with an accuser's finger. And yours, and yours. Who will take the food from your children's mouths? He waited theatrically for an answer, cocking his head, smiling at them while his eyes smouldered. Brothers, 
I tell you who it'll be. Two and tuppenny black kaffirs. That's who it will be. They came upon their feet. A bench here and there crashing over backwards and their voices were a blood roar of anger. Clenched fists thrust out in fury. No, brothers, no. Their booted feet stamped in unison and they chanted, their fists punching into empty air. Fergus MacDonald sat down abruptly and Harry Fisher congratulated him silently, squeezing his shoulder in a bear's paw before lumbering to his feet. Your executive has recommended that all members of our union come out on general strike. I put it to you now, brothers. All those in favour, he bellowed, and his voice was drowned in a thousand others. Out, brothers. We're out. 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 Fergus leaned forward in his seat and looked down the length of the trestle table. Helena's dark head was bowed over the minute book, but she sensed his gaze and looked up. Her expression glowed with a fanatic's ecstasy, and there was open adoration in her eyes that he saw only at moments like this. Harry Fisher had told him once, for all women, power is the ultimate aphrodisiac. No matter how puny in body, no matter what he looks like, power makes a man irresistible. In the thunder of thousands of voices, the pounding feet and the heady roar of power, Fergus was on his feet again. The mine owners, the bosses have challenged us. They have scorned your executive. They have stated publicly that we are too faint-hearted to rally the workers and come out on general strike. Well, brothers, we're going to show them. The lion's voice of the crowd rose again, and he silenced it only after another minute. First, we are going to drive on the scabs. There are going to be no strike breakers. When the sound subsided, he went on. Slim Yanni Smuts has talked of force to beat a strike. He has an army. But we are going to have one also. I think the bosses have forgotten that we fought their bloody war for them in France and East Africa, at Tabora and Delville Wood. The names sobered them and they were listening again. Last time we fought for them, but this time we are fighting for ourselves. Each one of you will report to his area commander. You will be formed into fighting commanders. Each man will know his job and each man will know what is at stake. We will beat them, brothers, the bloody bosses and their greedy, grasping minions. We will fight them and beat them. They are organised into military-style commandos, said the Prime Minister softly, breaking the crisp brown roll of bread with fingers that were surprisingly small, neat and capable as a woman's. Of course we know that George Mason wanted to form Labour commandos in 1914. It was the main reason I had him deported. The other guests at the luncheon table were silent. The deportation of Mason was not an episode that reflected credit on Yanni Smuts. But this is a different animal we are dealing with now. Nearly all the younger members of the Union are trained veterans. Five hundreds of them paraded outside the Trade Union Hall in Fordsburg last Saturday. He turned and smiled that impish, irresistible smile at his hostess. My dear Ruth, you must forgive my bad manners. This talk detracts from the delicious meal you have provided. The table was set under the oak trees on lawns so vivid green that Ruth always thought of them as English green. The house itself had the solid, imposing bulk of Georgian England, so different from the frivolous fairy castle at Emoyeni. The illusion of old England was spoiled only by the soaring cliffs of grey rock that rose as a backdrop to the scene. The sheer slopes of Table Mountain were softened by the pine trees that clung precariously for footholds on each ledge and in each tiny pocket of soil. Ruth smiled at him. In this house, General, you may do as you wish. Thank you, my dear. The smile flickered off his face, and the merry twinkle of the pale blue eyes changed to the glint of swords. As he turned back to his listeners, they are seeking confrontation, gentlemen. It's a blatant test of our power and resolution. Ruth caught Mark's eye at the foot of the table, and he rose to refill the glasses with cold, pale wine tinged with a touch of green, dry and crisp and refreshing. But as he moved down the board, pausing beside each guest, three cabinet ministers, a visiting British earl, the secretary of the Chamber of Mines, he was listening avidly. We can only hope you put it too highly, Prime Minister, Sean Courtney intervened gruffly. They have only broomsticks with which to drill and bicycles on which to ride into battle. And while they laughed, Mark paused behind Sean's chair with the bottle forgotten in his hand. He was remembering the cellars below the Trade Union Hall in Fordsburg, the racks of modern rifles, the gleaming P-14 reserved for him, 
and the sinister squatting vicar's machine gun. When he returned to the present, the conversation had moved on. Sean Courtney was assuring the company that militant action by the unions was unlikely and that in the worst circumstances, the army was geared to immediate call-up. Mark had a small office adjoining the general study. It had previously been a linen room, but was just large enough to accommodate a desk and several shelves of files. The general had ordered a large window knocked through one wall to give it air and light, and now, with his ankles crossed and propped on the desktop, Mark was staring thoughtfully out of the window. The view across lawns and through oaks encompassed a sweep of Rhodes Avenue, named after that asthmatic old adventurer who had seized an empire in land and diamonds and ended up Prime Minister of the First Cape Parliament before suffocating from his weak lungs and heavy conscience. The Cape home of the Courtneys was named Somerset Lodge after Lord Charles, the 19th century governor, and the great houses on the opposite side of Rhodes Avenue perpetuated the colonial tradition. Newlands House and Hidding House, gracious edifices in spacious grounds. Looking out of them through the new window, Mark was comparing them with the miners' cottages in Fordsburg Dip. He had not thought of Fergus and Helena in many months, but the conversation at lunch had brought them back forcibly, and he felt himself torn by sharply contradictory loyalties. He had lived in both worlds now and seen how each opposed the other. He was trying to think without emotion, but always a single image intruded, the cruel shape of weapons in orderly racks, deep in a dark cellar, and the slick smell of gun oil in his throat. He lit another cigarette, delaying the decision. Through the solid teak door, the sound of voices from the general's study was muted. The higher, clearer tones of the Prime Minister, bird-like almost, set against the rumbling of Sean's replies. The Prime Minister had stayed on after the other luncheon guests had left, as he often did, but Mark wished that he would leave now, thus deferring the decision with which he was wrestling. He had been trusted by a comrade, somebody who had shared mortal danger with him, and then had unstintingly shared the hospitality of his home, had trusted him like a brother, had not hesitated to give him access to the direst knowledge, had not hesitated to leave him alone with his wife. Mark had betrayed half of that trust, and he stirred restlessly in his seat as he remembered those wicked stolen days and nights with Helena. Now must he betray the rest of the trust that Fergus MacDonald had placed in him? Once more the image of rack weapons passed before his eyes. They faded only slowly to be replaced with a vivid, shocking picture of a face. It was the face of a marble angel, smooth and white and strangely beautiful, with blue eyes in pale blue sockets, a burst of pale golden curls escaping from under the rim of the steel helmet onto the smooth, pale forehead. Mark dropped his feet from the desk with a crash, fighting away the memory of the young German sniper, forcing it from his mind and coming to his feet abruptly. He found that his hands were shaking, and he crushed out the cigarette and turned to the door. His knock was over loud and demanding, and the voice from beyond was gruff with irritation. Come in! He stepped through. What do you want, Mark? You know I don't... Sean Courtney cut himself short and the tone of his voice changed to concern as he saw Mark's face. What is it, my boy? I, I have something to tell you, sir, he blurted. They listened with complete attention as he described his involvement with the executive of the Communist Party, and then broke off to steel himself for the final betrayal. These men were my friends, sir. They treated me as comrades. You must understand why I'm telling you this, please. Go on, Mark. Sean Courtney nodded, and the Prime Minister had drawn back in his chair, still and quiet and unobtrusive, sensing the struggle of conscience in which the young man was involved. Man was involved. Man was involved. Man was involved. I came to believe that much of what they were striving for was good and just, opportunity and a share of life for every man, but I could not accept the methods that they had chosen to bring these about. Uh, what do you mean, Mark? They are planning a war, a class war, sir. Uh, you have proof of that, Sean's voice did not rise, and he asked the question carefully. Yes, I have, Mark drew a deep breath before he went on. I have seen the rifles and machine guns they have ready for the day. The Prime Minister shifted in his chair, and then was still again. But now he was leaning forward to listen. Go on, Sean nodded, and Mark told them in detail, stating the unadorned facts, reporting exactly what he had seen and where.
accurately estimating the numbers and types of every weapon, and finally ending. MacDonald led me to believe that this was only one arsenal and that there were others, many others, on the Witwatersrand. Nobody spoke for many minutes. And then the Prime Minister stood up and went to the telephone on Sean's desk. He wound the crank handle and the whirr word was loud and obtrusive in the silent room. This is the Prime Minister General Smut speaking. I want a maximum priority connection with Commissioner Truter, the Chief of the South African Police in Johannesburg, he said. And then listened, his expression bleak and his eyes sparkling angrily. Get me the exchange supervisor, he snapped, and then turned to Sean, still holding the earpiece. The line is down, floods in the Karoo, he explained. Indefinite delay. Then he turned his attention back to the telephone and spoke quietly for many minutes with the supervisor before cradling the earpiece. They will make the connection as soon as possible. He returned to his seat by the window and spoke across the room. You have done the right thing, young man. I hope so, Mark answered quietly, and the doubts were obvious. Shadows in his eyes and the strains of misery in his voice. I'm proud of you, Mark, Sean Courtney agreed. Once again you've done your duty. Will you excuse me now, please, gentlemen? Mark asked, and without waiting for a reply, crossed to the door of his own office. The two men stared at the closed teak door long after it had closed, and it was the Prime Minister who spoke first. A remarkable young man, he mused aloud. Compassion and a sense of duty. He has qualities that could carry him to great heights, qualities for which one day we may be grateful, Sean nodded. I sensed them at our first meeting so strongly that I sought him out. We will need him, and others like him in the years ahead, old Sean, Yanni Smuts stated, and then switched his attention. Truto will have a search warrant issued immediately, and with God's help we will crush the head of the snake before it has a chance to strike. We know about this man, MacDonald, and of course we have been watching Fisher for years. Mark had walked for hours, escaping from the tiny box of his office. He had been driven by his conscience and his fears, striding out under the oaks, following narrow lanes, crossing the little stone bridge over the Lespiak stream, torturing himself with thoughts of Judas. They hang traitors in Pretoria, he thought suddenly, and he imagined Fergus MacDonald, standing on the trap in the barn-like room while the hangman pinioned his arms and ankles. He shuddered miserably and stopped walking, with his hands thrust deeply into his pockets and shoulders hunched, and he looked up to find himself standing outside the post office. Afterwards he realised that it had probably been his destination all along, but now it seemed an omen. He did not hesitate a moment but hurried into the office and found a pile of telegram forms on the desk. The nib of the pen was faulty, and it spluttered the pale, watery ink and stained his fingers. MacDonald, 55 Lovers Walk, Fordsburg. They know what you have got in the cellar. Get rid of it. He did not sign it. The post office clerk assured him that if he paid the seven pence for urgent rating, the message would have priority as soon as the northern lines were reinstated. Mark wandered back into the street, feeling sick and depleted by the crisis of conscience, not certain that he had done the right thing in either circumstance, and he wondered just how futile was his hope that he might have forced Fergus MacDonald to throw that deadly cargo down some disused mine shaft before death and revolution was turned loose upon the land. It was almost dark as Fergus MacDonald wheeled his bicycle into the shed and paused in the small backyard to slip the clips off the cuffs of his trousers before going on to the kitchen door. The smell of cooking cabbage filled the small room with a steamy, moist cloud that made him pause and blink. Helena was sitting at the kitchen table, and she hardly glanced up as he entered. A cigarette dangled from her lips with an inch of grey ash clinging hopelessly to the end of it. She still wore the grabby dressing gown she had worn at breakfast and it was clear that she had neither bathed nor changed since then. Her hair had grown longer, and now dangled in oily black snakes to her cheeks. She had grown heavier in the last months, the line of her jaw blurring with a padding of fat, and the hair on her upper lip darker and denser, breasts bulging and drooping heavily, 
in the open front of the gown. Hello then, love, Fergus shrugged out of his jacket and dropped it across the back of a kitchen chair. She turned the page of the pamphlet she was reading, squinting at the curl of blue smoke that drifted across her eyes. Fergus opened a black bottle of porter, and the gas hissed fiercely. Anything happened today? Something for you, she nodded at the kitchen dresser, and the cigarette ash dropped down the front of her gown, settling in fine grey flakes. Carrying the bottle, Fergus crossed to the dresser and fingered the buff envelope. One of your popsies? Helen chuckled at the unlikeliness of her sally, and Fergus frowned and tore open the envelope. He stared at the message for long, uncomprehending seconds before he swore bitterly. Jesus Christ! He slammed the bottle down on the kitchen table with a crash. Even this late in the evening, there were small groups on each street corner. They had that disconsolate and bored air of men with too little to fill their days. Even the commando drilling and the nightly meetings were beginning to pour. As Fergus MacDonald pedalled furiously through the darkening streets, his first alarm and fright turned to fierce exultation. The time was right. They were as ready as they would ever be. If time drifted on without decisive action from either side, the long, boring days of strike inactivity would erode their determination. What had seemed like disaster merely minutes before, he now saw was a heaven-sent opportunity. Let them come. We will be ready for them, he thought, and braked alongside a group of four loungers on the pavement outside the public bar of the Grand Fordsburg Hotel. Get a message to all area commanders there to assemble at the trade hall immediately. It's an emergency. Brothers, hurry. They scattered quickly, and he pedalled on up the rising ground of the dip, calling out his warning as he went. In the trade union offices, there were still a dozen or so members. Most of them were eating sandwiches and drinking thermos tea, while a few worked on the issue of strike relief coupons to union families. But the relaxed atmosphere changed as Fergus burst in. All right, comrades, it's beginning. The Zarps are on their way. It was classic police tactics. They came in at the first light of dawn. The advance guard rode down into the dip of land between Fordsburg and the railway crossing, where the Johannesburg Road ran down between sleazy cottages and overgrown plots of open ground, thick with weeds and mounds of rotting refuse. There was a heavy ground mist in the dip, and the nine troopers on police charges waded through it as though fording the sluggish waters of a river crossing. They had muted harness and muffled accoutrement, so that it was in ghostly silence that they breasted the softly swirling mists. The light was not yet strong enough to pick out their badges and burnished buttons. It was only the dark silhouette of their helmets that identified them. Fifty yards behind the leading troopers followed the two police carriages, high four-wheelers with barred windows to hold prisoners, and beside each one of them marched ten constables. They carried their rifles at the slope, and were stepping out sharply to keep up with the carriages. As they entered the dip, the mist engulfed them chest high, so that their disembodied trunks bobbed in the white soft surface. They looked like strange dark sea animals, and the mist muted the tramp of their boots. Fergus MacDonald's scouts had picked them up before they reached the railway crossing, and for three miles had been pacing them, slipping back unseen ahead of the advance, Runners reporting every few minutes to the cottage where Fergus had established his advance headquarters. All right, Fergus snapped as another of the dark figures ducked through the hedge of the sanitary lane behind the cottage and mumbled his report through the open window. They're all coming in on the main road. Pull the other pickets out and get them here right away. The man grunted an acknowledgement and was gone. Fergus had his pickets on every possible approach to the town centre. The police might have split into a number of columns, but it seemed his precautions were unnecessary. Secure in the certainty of complete surprise and in overwhelming force, they were not bothering with diversion or flanking manoeuvres. Twenty-nine troopers, Fergus calculated, together with the four drivers, was indeed a formidable force, more than sufficient if it had not been for the warning from some unknown ally. Fergus hurried through into the front parlour of the cottage. The family had been moved out before midnight. All the cottages along the road had been cleared. The grumpy, squalling children in pyjamas carried on the shoulders of their fathers, the women with white, frightened faces in the lamplight bundling a few precious possessions with them as they hurried away. 
Now the cottages seemed deserted. No lights showed, and the only sound was the mournful howling of a mongrel dog down in the dip. Yet in each cottage at the windows that faced onto the road, silent men waited. Fergus spoke to one of them in a whisper, and he pointed down into the misty hollow, then spat and worked around into the breech of the Lee Enfield rifle, which was propped on the windowsill. The rifle bolt made a small metallic clash that lit a sparkle of memory and made the hair rise on Fergus's neck. It was all so familiar. The silence, the mist, and the night fraught with the menace of coming violence. Only on my order, Fergus warned him softly. Easy now, lads. Let them come right in the front door before we slam it on their heads. He could see the leading horseman now. Half a mile away, but coming on fast in the strengthening light. It wasn't shooting light yet, but the sky beyond the dark hills of the mine dumps was turning to that pale gull's egg blue that promised shooting light within minutes. Fergus looked back at the road. The mist was an added bonus. He'd not counted on that, but often when you did not call for fortune, she came a-knocking. The mist would persist until the first rays of the morning sun warmed and dispersed it, another half hour at least. You all know your orders, Fergus raised his voice, and they glanced at him, distracted for only a moment from their weapons and the oncoming enemy. They were all good men, veterans, blooded, as the sanguine generals of France would have it. It flashed through Fergus' mind once again how ironical it was that men who had been trained to fight by the bosses were now about to tear down the structure which the bosses had trained them to defend. We will tear down and rebuild, he thought, with exultation tingling in his blood. We will destroy them with their own weapons, strangle them with their own dirty loot. He stopped himself and pulled the dark grey cloth down over his eyes and turned up the collar of his coat. Good luck to all of us, brothers, he called softly, and slipped out through the front door. That old bugger has got guts, acknowledged one of the soldiers at the window. You're right, he ain't afraid of nothing, agreed another, as they watched him dodge under the cover of the hedge and run forward until he reached the ditch beside the road and jumped down into it. There were a dozen men lying there below the lip, and as he dropped beside them, one of them handled him a pick handle. You strung that wire good and tight? Fergus asked, and the man grunted. Tighter than a monkey's asshole. The man grinned wolfishly at him, his teeth glinting in the first soft light of morning. And I checked the pegs myself. They'll hold against a charging elephant. Right, brothers, Fergus told them. With me, when I give the word. And he lifted himself until he could see over the low blanket of mist. The trooper's helmets bobbed in the mist as they came on up the slope, and now he could make out the sparkle of brass cap badges and see the dark, stick-like barrels of their carbines rising above each right shoulder. Fergus had paced out the rangers himself and marked them with pieces of rag tied to the telephone posts on the verge. As they came up to the 150-yard mark, Fergus stood up from the ditch and stepped into the middle of the road. He held his pick handle above his head and shouted, Halt! Stay where you are! His men rose out of the mist behind him and moved swiftly into position like a well-drilled team. Dark, ominous figures standing shoulder to shoulder, blocking the road from verge to verge, holding their pick handles ready across their hips, faces hidden by caps and collars. 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 